A Forgotten Memory by a Lonely Raven When I was a young child, around the age of five, I got my own room. It was the smallest one, only about the size of a kitchen, but it suited my needs and I was happy with it. It had a bed and my very own dresser with the TV. My parents saw that I was responsible enough for it. I never really was afraid of the dark. Thunderstorms at night never bothered me much. I took care of all my belongings, and I was a polite kid. So, I was granted my own mini living space. The thing that was most strange about the room was the closet. It hadn't been used in years, not since my sister had moved out. It was a very large, narrow walk-in closet and used to be lined with shirts, pants, shoes, and other things when my sister Janice lived in the room. What made the closet different from the rest of the room was that instead of being painted a colorful shade of red like the rest of the walls, the door was just a dull white. It really stood out, like a sore thumb you could say. I didn't have nearly enough clothes to use up all that space. As a result, there was always a darkened corner of the closet at the very back where I didn't keep clothes. There were probably cobwebs and dozens of rats back there. For some strange reason, I didn't like looking at the corner. Whenever I accidentally caught a glimpse of it, the suspense in the room rocketed, and I had to look away with a shiver. This happened on multiple occasions, but I never really told anyone. If I told my parents, they'd think I was just a scared little kid and take away my room. For two years afterwards, I just avoided it. It became a routine to just not look there. Besides, most times the door was closed and locked, so there was usually not a corner to look at. Out of sight, out of mind. Or oh, so I thought. You see, I've always thought I heard noises whenever I closed the door. Like, as soon as I would walk out, I would hear footsteps bounding towards me from the back. I'd turn around, slam the door shut, and lock it. I never told my parents. Again, they'd think I wasn't responsible enough and take away my room. And I really liked my room. That's when, at the age of seven, an event occurred and will remain in my mind for many years, possibly forever. I've decided not to take it to my grave. I really need to tell someone. Only recently did these events come back to my mind. I've tried my best to forget, but what is seen cannot be unseen. I was sleeping in my room. I had done all my nighttime routines. I had brushed my teeth, washed my face, went to the bathroom, did fifty or so push-ups or sit-ups, and set my alarm. I was now asleep in my bed, ready to start school the next morning. I woke up to the sound of a knob turning. At first, I thought it was morning, and it was just my mum coming in to wake me up. After thinking for a second, I realized that the sound was coming from the opposite side of the room. But it wasn't just that. The lock on the door clicked, and the door creaked open. My half-asleep mind took a few seconds to register what the sound meant. I yawned a bit, then my eyes shut open and I froze. Something unlocked the closet from the other side of the door. Impossible. There was no other lock. I made sure the door was locked every night. It was part of my routine. I distinctly remembered closing it and even testing it to make sure. There wasn't a lock on the other side. There just wasn't. I lay still, shaking slightly and whimpering. Suddenly the opening door stopped and it was silent. I could hear footsteps in my room walking towards me. I dared not turn around. For a brief moment of peace, I really thought it was just my mum. 
Then they stopped halfway across the room. Silence regained, and for an uncomfortable moment, I thought I had simply been imagining it. The only sound was my heart thumping in my chest. As it slowed, I turned around and looked around my room. Standing in the middle of the room, exactly where the footsteps had stopped, there stood a creature. A humanoid beast. Definitely not of this world, or of any world. It had black sunken eyes and pale wrinkled skin. Sharp claws the size of butcher blades dragged along the wooden floor with a soft scratching sound. Its limbs were abnormally skinny, and they bent and contorted in odd shapes. Teeth gleamed like daggers, stained with a black ooze that dripped out like slobber. It opened its mouth and gaped at me. Black thick ooze gushed out like blood and it uttered a small, barely audible groan. It was uncomfortable to look at. My blood went ice cold and it hurt my veins. The color drained from my face and my eyes widened to the size of dinner plates. It pointed a gnarled finger at me and began to walk towards my bed. By now my mouth was hanging open and my voice was gone. My stomach lurched when it began walking towards me, and my heart began to pump furiously again. It took small, short steps, but I couldn't move. My legs were frozen, and I couldn't avert my eyes from the horrible sight before me. The black liquid began making puddles on the ground as it walked, the ooze dripping down its gnarled skin. It began growling, and by the time my legs could move, it was at my bedside. I backed up and reached for my lamp. It stopped and stepped back. Those blank, horrid eyes gleamed at me, the silhouette of claws forming a fist. It put its head up and screamed. Its voice was cracked and warped and not very pleasant to listen to. If you've ever heard a song played backwards, then you know what the voice sounded like. It was a voice that came straight from hell. I cringed and covered my ears. I reached again for the lamp. It stopped and looked at me. It snarled and white fangs as long as bananas shot out, gleaming in the moonlight. They had definitely grown from their previous size. At that, it crouched and leaped on top of my bed with the agility of a cat. The claws of its feet dug into the bedsheet and tore the mattress, sending a flurry of feathers into the air. The creature reached a clawed hand up and swiped at my face, tearing the skin like paper. I screamed. Blood rushed out from my wounded face and spilled onto the sheet, staining it a deep velvet. I whimpered, and the adrenaline was causing me to black out. The creature screamed again and bounded off my bed. As my eyes began to close, I saw it look around. It heard something, and jumped forward with incredible speed. The beast crashed through the window, sending shards of glass rocketing into the air with a high-pitched shatter. I lost consciousness, and all went black. I woke several hours later. The sheets were stained dark velvet, and the black liquid still remained in the small puddles on the ground. From the look of it, I hadn't been out for very long. I was coursing with fear and my breath was shaky as I whimpered slightly. I screamed for my parents and they came rushing in. I explained with shaky words what had happened and they comforted me and told me it was all a dream. They looked nervously at each other. Honey, it's okay. Just a nightmare, that's alright. I'll go get you some more milk, son. My father agreed, heading out. I looked at them and shook my head. No! They looked back. I squirmed out of my mother's arm. There was something in my room. It was real. It slashed my face. See? I turned my face and presented my wounded cheek to them. You see? We need to get out. Call the police. Just go back to bed, hun. We promise it was really nothing. 
No, you don't understand. Just go to bed. My father presented me with a cup of warm milk. Good night, son. With that, they walked out and were gone. The next morning, I walked into the bathroom and looked at my cheek. There was nothing. Not a scratch. I looked at my bed sheets, and they were completely clean. I really had no choice but to brush it off as a nightmare. They never did believe me about the events of that night. They sent me to several child psychologists, but they simply described it as a night terror. As for the black ooze, they never heard about it again. On several occasions I asked my parents about it, but they just looked at me and said nothing. As soon as possible, they changed the subject. Believe me, all I've ever wanted was to forget about it. I moved back into a room with my brother and suffered nightmares for many years because of the events of February 8th, 1987. Several months later, the house was foreclosed, for some reasons my parents never told me. My parents packed us up quick, and within a week, we were in a new house. I only recently remembered this. I've decided to write to you guys about this because I've realized something that took me years to make sense of. And I really wish I hadn't. Whatever that thing had been wasn't coming out of the closet. It was going back in. The Miners By the Arkin Silverton used to be a mining town. Coal, to be exact. It flourished some decades ago, but has since faded away into a small, average American town. It used to have two movie theatres, a bank, and several hotels, but now all it has is a convenience store and a bar. How appropriate. There are mines everywhere in Silverton. Everywhere. Anyway, I grew up in this town, and moved away when I was 15 to a larger neighbouring town called Yoma, and I was still close enough to hang out with my friend Gary on a regular basis which made the move not so bad. But, anyway, I'm rambling. That day I was visiting Silverton to see Gary and some family before I went to college the next week. I called up Gary the night before and asked, Hey, know anything interesting to do around Silverton? Well, something unique that we haven't done before. I heard his nostrils snort air on the phone as he was clearly thinking. Finally, he replied excitedly, I think I may have something adventurous, but I'll have to explain it to you when you come over. Gary was never the one to be patient, especially about something he was clearly interested in. I went along with it. Okay, man, I'll see you tomorrow then? He hesitated. Yeah, yeah, sure, tomorrow, man. The next morning I got into my red sedan and was off to Silverton, enjoying the sights as I went. I always loved the scenery around here. Oh! I looked to my right and saw that there was an opening to a mine shaft. I turned away and saw something greyish moving out of the corner of my eye. Quickly looked back to see... Nothing. Is my mind playing tricks on me? I said aloud as a reassurance. I arrived at Gary's U-shaped driveway and saw him waiting on the porch for me. It's about time, asshole! He screamed in excitement. <laughs> hey man, what's all the excitement about? Okay, so get this. I've been talking to old people in town about the Bloomberg incident. Obviously intrigued, I asked. And what would that be? And with that look of pure fascination that was rarely seen on him, he explained. The Bloomberg incident was a period of several months between 1897 and 1898 where several miners and townsfolk around the area went missing were never heard from again, and no remains or evidence was ever recovered. It all started after this guy named Gresham Bloomberg, hunter and miner, came into the town after a hunting trip and kept babbling on about these weird animals that he found hunting that day. He described them as 
on all fours, some gray, some with blackish fur, claws, opposable thumbs, and four purple eyes that glowed in the dark. And of course, everyone thought he was crazy, so he went into the woods to kill one and prove it to them. Later that night, they heard a blood-curdling scream, and a couple of guys went to investigate. And they found only a bloody gun and a couple of bones with meat still attached. I asked him, What's the point in this? He grinned really big and said, Come inside. I followed him into his room and he explained once more. After the Bloomberg incident, everyone kept seeing these creatures in the forest and, like I said, people started disappearing. Now everyone's description of these things was always the same. They're about four feet when they were on all fours. When they stood, they towered about eight. They were extremely fast and could climb trees with ease. And the main thing everyone seemed to notice most was their purple eyes and their screeching. People would wake up in the middle of the night to see those purple eyes outside their window. Or in the trees. Accompanied by their signature, Greek. Some children even reported seeing them in their closets. They were even reported to have been in the mines as well. Every time one of them was sighted in the mines, it collapsed the same day and killed dozens of miners. Very interested, I listened on. This happened from February 1897 to January of 1898. Then all of a sudden, stopped. I thought why to myself, but waited for him to answer that himself. Nobody knows why it stopped or why they were there, but the townsfolk started referring to them as the miners. Found something similar in Native American mythology. Go ahead, I've got the page marked. I turned to page 67 as the book instructed and saw a black and white photograph of a grayish figure on all fours with its arms around its legs and staring in an intimidating pose. The page on these things was very short and to the point. The purple ones as they were called, but every time they were, their appearances were always accompanied by clicking noises and four distinct purple eyes. They only appear at night, and they are never alone. Now came the part where the skeptical part of my brain kicked in. I was obviously very intrigued, but I was debating in my mind whether all of this was just a myth as the book stated, or at the very least, a bit of a fact behind it. I mean, I lived here until I was 15, and I'd never heard about any of this. Where are you going with this, Gary? He walked over to his computer desk and pulled out a folder marked Public Records, Yuma County, and threw it at me. It was the investigation of one of the mine cave-ins. I examined the picture closely and realized that it was of the mineshaft opening I had seen on the way over here. Hey, you remember this place, right? It's just right down the road from here. Yeah, I remember. But that's not the point in showing you this picture. He pointed in the background, behind the two officers, and there were two grayish figures on the tree line. No fucking way. Gary, you fucking photoshopped this. He started laughing and said, do you honestly think I would spend all my time to photoshop a picture and make bullshit up just to scare you? I thought for a split second and replied, Yes. He laughed again and said, Well, it's nice to know how much you trust me, man. But there's a reason I'm telling you this. I looked at him cautiously and waited for his reason. That cave-in happened after the miners were supposedly seen. So there's a chance that when the cave-in collapsed... The miner was killed also. So let's go explore it and see if we can find one, eh? He is fucking nuts, I thought to myself. That's the stupidest fucking thing I've ever heard come out of your mouth, Gary. What if it collapses whilst we're down there? He stood up from his chair and said, Well, you don't have to go, but I want to see what's down there. And besides, this would make a great story to tell all those girls at your college. He gave me a mischievous wink. I pondered a moment, and Gary looked at me and said sarcastically, You're just scared of the miners. I looked at him and said, Dude, that shit isn't even true. It can't be true. He pushed the photo in my face and pointed at the figures near the woods and said, 
I guess you don't mind proving that then. I caved in. Pun intended. <laughs> okay, Gary. But we're not staying down there for long. And if we hear a creaking or a sign of collapse, we're getting the hell out of there. He nodded in approval and replied. Or if we see the miners? I gave him a bullshit look and said, Let's just get this over with, okay? We went to the only store in town and bought some flashlights, a couple of packs of batteries and several bottles of water. The clerk asked us, You guys going hacking or something? I was about to say, Well, when Gary interrupted with, Yeah, right around Pike Hill. The clerk looked at him and said, Be very careful around there. There's a lot of old mine shafts that could cave in on you. He reassured her with, We will. This is our fourth time going out there. He was lying his ass off, but I went along with it. Yeah, we have an old map that shows locations of the mines, so we know where the hike is. We left the store and into the sedan we went. Gary winked at me and pulled out his dad's 357 Magnum. What the fuck are you doing with that? I said, a little agitated. You never know what you'll find in the woods, he said with a smirk. Like the miner, I said, laughing sarcastically. While on the way to the mine, I saw another greyish figure out of the corner of my eye. I didn't look, because I knew it was just my mind playing tricks again. Ah, good old Brewer Road. Complete with abandoned farmhouses, rusted farm equipment scattered around expansive fields of dead grass. We approached the gate and I got chills. The bold, no trespassing sign did not help. No trespassing, Gary. Should go back. He looked at me with a smirk and said, Trespassing, tres means three, and there's only you and me. That's only two. Always being a smart ass. Fine, you first. We climbed over the rusty barbed wire fence and walked about a half a mile into the woods and saw a broken windmill and a pond. I looked down and noticed that the ground was scattered with coal and glass. We walked towards the pond, and the mine came into our line of sight. The mine stuck up out of the ground like the entrance to hell. It was a stone arch. A stone arch to hell, I said out loud. Gary laughed as we approached the entrance, pointed his flashlight into the mine, and said, Feet first into hell. The mine was filled in with boards and barbed wire clumsily thrown around to try and block anyone entering. We turned our flashlights on and walked into hell. We walked around and over this junk for about ten minutes until we finally hit clear stairs. It was cold in there. It hit us like a drunk driver. I watched as the surface light slowly faded away and the oxygen thinned. We walked for about fifteen minutes until we saw it even out into a walkway. The oxygen was so thin. I'm out of breath, man, I said to Gary. He nodded in mutual agreement and said, yeah, we're not even- Oh, shit! He fell forward and his body made a loud thrash on the floor of the mine. It shook the wooden foundation beams. I shined the flashlight behind us and saw that he had tripped on a loose brick that made up the stairs. Well, I guess that's the end of the stairs, I said whilst laughing. I helped him up and he said, Hardy fucking har. I couldn't help but laugh. After it all settled down, we looked around and reality set in. This place was scary as shit. Silent. Never-ending silence. I shined the flashlight at the wooden support beams, and I swear they were about to break. I looked over at Gary and said in an unsure voice, So, forward? He was looking around with his flashlight and said, You've come this far, so I suppose. I admit I was so scared I was numb by it but I actually wanted to see what we would find down here. Gary screamed at the top of his lungs, Hey, miners, we're here! I turned to him and punched him in the arm and said, Shut the fuck up! Gary laughed and said, Wow, scared much? Well, maybe a little, I admitted. We walked for another ten minutes, occasionally seeing old lanterns and wooden beams. I saw an old pickaxe and took it as a souvenir. What are you going to do with that? Stab the miners? He gave me a sarcastic stabbing motion. Guess we'll find out, won't we? He gave a smirk. 
Around 30 minutes in, I saw a pile of bones. I knelt down and shone my light on them to make sure the dark wasn't screwing with my eyesight. They were cow bones, and they still had rotting skin on them. Hey Gary, you might want to come and see this. He looked at them and said an already known fact. Dude, those are cow bones. Nothing to worry about, he said in a matter-of-fact tone. That doesn't matter, Gary. How in the hell did they get down here? He looked puzzled. Obviously, that didn't register until now. I heard a clicking noise right behind me and heard Gary scream. Oh my god! I froze with fear and darted towards the entrance. Hey, come back! Gary was laughing. It's just... It's just a ringtone! He said, pausing in between words because of his laughter. You fucking asshole! I was hyperventilating. I punched him in the stomach and made him drop his phone. Oh, you ass! He barely got out due to his lack of breath. The phone was on its backside and its light shone 360 degrees. And I saw purple eyes and jumped back only to see that they were gone. I offered my hand and apologized. I'm sorry, man. I'm just scared as hell. When he got to his feet, he said, Yeah, I think we've gone far enough and found nothing. We should probably head back now. We shined our flashlights around and noticed that there was another path. Although it didn't look man-made, more like a giant rabbit hole. I looked over at him, seeing his curiosity, and said, I guess feet first into hell? He smirked and said, Oh, you can read me like a book. He walked forward and I followed. We got around the first bend and saw that there was a light ahead. The old lanterns were glowing. I whispered to Gary, What the fuck is this? He looked scared and puzzled and replied, I don't fucking know, man. I looked at the walls and noticed they were made out of some metallic material. Are these hieroglyphics? And pointed the flashlight to the pictures on the wall that to this day I cannot describe. We pushed forward against our better judgment. We came across a room lit with candles and saw these grayish figures feasting on a cow. They looked like a mixture between a human, animal, and insect. There were fangs hanging out of their mouths that were tearing into the animal's flesh. And their claws were snapping the bones with ease, and their long tongues were slurping up the bone marrow. They seemed to be communicating with each other through their crick noises. They were hunched over, and one stood up, sharply turning in our direction. Those damn eyes... It pointed at us and Gary screamed, FUCKING RUN! We took off running as fast as humanly possible and heard the crooking noises coming from everywhere. I could hear them breathing down my neck. If I even slowed down, these things would rip me to shreds. I ran until my saliva tasted of nickel. My throat burned with the taste of beef jerky. I heard my clothes being slashed at, tearing into my skin. I remembered the pickaxe. I still had it in my hand. I turned around and rammed it into one of the creature's head and it made a terrifying screech. There were more coming, so I struggled to catch up to Gary. Don't let anyone tell you track is a useless sport because right now it's saving my ass. My adrenaline rush wore off and my body was giving out. My veins pumped battery acid now and my throat was pure fire. How far were we in here? I heard the miners crawling on the walls and running towards me. Ah! I heard Gary scream. He tripped on the staircase, again. I ran to help him up when one of the miners clawed his back, deep. He grabbed a loose brick and rammed it into its head and kept hitting. Gary, stop! We have to get the hell out of here! I heard more of the things coming, and my flashlight reflected the purple eyes. I threw my flashlight at one of them and we ran up the stairs, the miners getting ever closer. I could see light, thank God. Slash! It clawed at the back of one of my legs, and I kicked it in the face. Gary took one of the boards scattered around and hit it back into the mine. We made it out! If there is a god, I'll send him a fruitcake, Gary said. I suddenly realized that the miners were real. I felt really bad for all those miners and children that fell victim to these bastards. I looked at Gary's back, and he was bleeding a lot. 
Gary, we need to get you to a hospital, I said, panicking. The nearest hospital is down the mountain and around Highway 63. The sun was setting. I helped him into the car and we started around the mountain. I saw a greyish figure out of the corner of my eye. I hoped that it was my mind playing tricks on me. But I saw the purple eyes jumping tree to tree and darting across the road. We got to the top of the mountain and it started to rain. I saw one of them on the road just staring at me. I sped up. All right, motherfucker, let's play! I screamed. Gary screamed. What the fuck are you doing? Don't hit it! We'll go over the edge! Too late. I hit it with my car and it flipped over the mountain edge and we started rolling down the side. Everything was rapidly turning upside down and vice versa until we hit a tree on the passenger side. The whole car was upside down and there was blood and broken glass everywhere. I woke some time later and looked over at Gary and asked, You okay, man? He was out cold. I unbuckled my seatbelt that landed on my head and had to reposition myself. I heard that noise everywhere. I was panicking. I kicked in what was left of the windshield and told Gary, I'm going to go for help. I looked near the console and saw Gary's gun and picked it up. I checked to see if it was loaded and lucky me, it was. Every direction was all I could hear. There must have been at least a dozen of these things. I got out of the car and looked up to the mountain we just rolled off of. It must have been at least a 150 foot roll. The sun had already set and it was pouring now. I saw all of the purple eyes in the trees just staring at me, waiting. I took off running as best as I could towards the road. The noises were everywhere, rapid and intimidating. I was running out of breath fast. Then crash, one landed right on me. It turned around looking at me, right in the eyes. This thing had mandibles. It had razor sharp teeth and two front fangs about four inches long. I put the gun up to its face and bam, I squeezed the trigger. Its blood was an oozy crimson and I was covered in it. I scrambled to my feet and continued up the hill. Only 75 feet to go. I felt a sharp pain in my shoulder and realized that one of them had bit into me and was tearing. I screamed in pain. It grabbed me and threw me down the hill as I started rolling and desperately trying to grab something. <clears throat> I hit a tree and grabbed on for dear life as the thing charged at me. I took aim, but the thing kicked the gun out of my hand and tried to bite me. I let go of the tree and began to roll down the hill once more. I hit the bottom and saw the thing getting closer and closer. I saw the gun, but it was too far away, so I grabbed the nearest rock as the creature landed on my chest. I hit it in the head with the rock and got to my feet and ran for the gun again. I jumped as the creature got to its feet. I grabbed the gun and pointed it at the creature and squeezed once more and bam, no more chest cavity. It fell to the ground dead, and I took to the hill once more and then crash. The ground beneath me caved in, and I fell about five foot but it was enough to sprain my ankle. I was delirious and I looked around and saw that I was in an animal-made tunnel. Oh shit, it hit me, like a ton of fucking bricks. I saw purple eyes and heard the noise everywhere. I lost it. I closed my eyes and put the gun up and shot off all of the bullets. Bam, 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 in every direction, screaming. I opened my eyes once more and saw there was nothing there breathed a sigh of relief and climbed back out of the tunnel and looked up towards the hill. I heard more of them running in the trees. I started back up the hill in a dead sprint. I saw headlights on the road. I made it to the road and flagged down the driver. Help! There's been an accident! He stepped out of the car and said, We're at! I pointed down the hill and said, My friend's down there. We hit an animal and swerved off the road. I was bleeding everywhere and covered in crimson ooze. We started to walk down the hill when I realized the miners were still down there. Where is he at, son? Man questioned. They pointed to the destroyed vehicle and realized that the miners were gone. Later on, I questioned why. 
but at that moment I didn't care. We got to Gary, and the man checked his pulse and breathing. He was alive. We need to get him to the hospital. We got him to the car, and the man looked at the claw marks in Gary's back and said, What happened exactly? I looked blankly in front of me, and said only, The Miners. Well, that's my story. I wanted to write it down in clarity before either I forgot or realized I was crazy. Gary survived, and we still see each other every now and then. The insurance agency and police checked the scene. Never found a single minor or any trace of them. Maybe I was hallucinating. I don't know, but Gary was right. My story was really popular in college. Even though I told them it was an urban legend from back home. Every year, me and Gary go to the entrance of the mine in a sort of ha-ha, we beat you ceremony to the miners. Every year, I grab a piece of coal and chuck it into the mine for some unknown reason. I wonder every year if all of it ever happened or maybe I was hallucinating or something. I'm standing at the entrance five years after it all happened. And I wonder if Gary thinks the same thing. Maybe they aren't real. I grab my annual piece of coal and throw it into the arch of hell. We started to walk away. When from inside the arches of hell, through the darkness, we hear it. Hello everyone, Nature's Temper here, just reminding you that we have t-shirts. If you want to support and show your love for the channel, look in the description below. There you will also find a t-shirt design called Bring Back the Wolf. All proceeds of this design go directly to the Rewilding Institute, a charity that I fully support. The Beast from Below By Go Go Robzilla I don't like Godzilla movies. I know, weird way to start a story, right? It seems so out of left field for any kind of the stuff you find on websites like the ones I'm posting this on. Most people would start their stories with some kind of description of how they got in the mess they're in, or some ominous warning. But all I've got is the fact I don't like movies about radioactive dinosaurs smashing cities. It's dumb. I know. See, the appeal of monster movies, if I had to describe it, is how impossible people think they are. According to accepted scientific law, animals that big simply can't exist on land because they'd collapse under their own body weight. I think Neil deGrasse Tyson said that once. Something along those lines, at least. I don't know. I'm not big on science. Never managed more than a passing grade in the subject in any school. But what I do know is that these people are full of crap. And I'm about to explain why. I remember the whole incident pretty fucking vividly for something that happened, I don't know, two or three years ago? The actual date is fuzzy, though even if I had the date, I wouldn't give it. I'm not going to tell you where this happened either but I'll describe the location as vaguely as I can manage without making it pointless. I live in a small rural town. It gets really hot in the summer, really cold in the winter, and ever since 1924, we've had 10-minute earthquakes every 10 years. It's kind of an accepted fact about the place at this point. Residents like to joke and call it Shakespeare, so we'll call it that for now. Anyone who lives here will know what I'm talking about. And for your sake, and everyone's, do not say anything about where Shakespeare actually is. Anyways, I've lived in Shakespeare my entire life. I was born the day after one of those earthquakes, and we've never left since, aside from the odd vacation. It's a pretty nice place, in all honesty. I have a job working a 9 to 5 at the local grocery store, pay my bills, and generally make a decent living. 
I'm not some massively creative person by any means. I just do what I need to get by and remain content with what I've got. But I'd always wondered what caused these earthquakes. I'm sure anyone who's been in this town for more than ten years has wondered that. In fact, no, I know it. We'd always talk about it after school, because we all had these weird feelings that it wasn't something natural. After all, they always happened on the same date, at the same time of day, and lasted for the same amount of time. Some kid named Jimmy, he was the weird one, he always said that it was because there was something beneath the earth, a species of mole people that burrowed through the earth every ten years or something like that. We all laughed it off, said it sounded ridiculous. Looking back, I almost wish it was that simple. It's happened three times in my life. The quakes, I mean. Once when I was nine years old, once when I was nineteen, and once when I was twenty-nine. The time when I was nineteen, I'd made a decision. I'd use the money I got from working at a local burger joint and get some equipment to figure out where the epicenter of the earthquakes were. I got a ruler, a high-quality compass, a printer and some paper, a beefy calculator, and I got to work. I watched the clock intently. A guide written by an undergraduate studying geology lists the following instructions, and these are the ones I followed for those curious. Number one, measure the time that elapses between the arrival of the primary wave, P, and the arrival of the secondary wave, S, to the seismic stations. Number two, using the SP time, determine the epicentral distance of each station to the earthquake using a travel time curve. Number three, Use a map and geographical compass to draw arcs of radii equal to the epicentral distances around each station. Where these arcs overlap, you may approximate your epicenter. I didn't manage to get a precise measurement. Maybe it was because I only had ten minutes to do it. Maybe it was because it was my first time. Or maybe the instructions were bad. I don't know. I'm no geologist but I did get a general direction. And the next day I called in sick, got some supplies, and walked in that direction, out of town, and into the woods surrounding it. I had the foresight to time my walk. Five hours there and back, in total. When you work at any kind of restaurant, you get used to standing on your feet all day. Looking back, I'm incredibly grateful for this, because I don't know if I could have made it all the way out there if I wasn't used to being on my feet like 24-7. But after two and a half hours about, I broke through the trees and found the weirdest thing I'd ever seen, up to that point. It was some kind of rock formation in the middle of some kind of clearing. And it was huge. Like it was so big that it could have been mistaken for a football stadium from really high up. I didn't even bother trying to walk around it. But something didn't seem right about it. For one, it was made of a bunch of jagged rocks that looked almost like canines. You know, the little fangs everyone has on the upper and lower lines of teeth. Run your tongue across your teeth, and if you feel little fangs, that's them. Some looked chipped, others didn't. But they were arranged into a circle, or maybe an oval. The way they were angled gave me the impression it could be either or, but the weirdest part is when I went over to it and managed to get a peek between them. All I saw was a hole. By this point, I decided that it was something to do with these rocks. Specifically what, though? That's what was confusing me. I made a personal note to come back there after a few hours before the earthquake happened again in ten years. And so, I then went home. Things just kind of went along as normal. In the ten years between then and the next quakes, I quit my job, found a new one, 
got hooked up with a girl I knew in high school, broke up with her after I caught her cheating on me, and moved into the house I own today. And every passing day inched me closer to it. I have to admit, I was kind of excited. I started having all these fantasies of showing my recordings to some scientist and becoming massively popular. This world-renowned guy who uncovered the mystery of the Shakespeare quakes. Finally, the big day arrived. After calling in sick and packing up my equipment, a camcorder, a tripod, a lawn chair, and some sodas and snacks in case I got hungry or thirsty, I chose to take my car that time, driving out to the location, parking my car out there, and getting everything set up. I started with the camcorder, getting it recording. It had enough battery life to last ten hours, and the quakes were due to start in one. I stood in front, gave my name and the exact time, stated my intent, adjusted it to make sure all was correctly set up and to get the full picture, and then set up my chair and waited. Fifty minutes passed, and then I thought I heard something. Something like distant movement. Something hard scraping against the dirt. It got steadily closer and closer, until I physically felt it moving beneath my feet, but it wasn't the exact time of the quakes to start, which left me more baffled than anything else. Of course, I quickly realized what was happening. Something was moving underground and causing a smaller, more localized quake. My mind briefly wandered back to that kid, Jimmy, and his idea of mole people. Then, the sharp, tooth-like rocks shuddered, and what came up from the hole they surrounded physically froze me to my chair in sheer, unadulterated horror. I felt myself shaking horribly, yet I couldn't voluntarily move a single muscle. It looked like some kind of gigantic worm. Its entire body was pitch black in terms of color. It didn't suck up light. It was just very, very dark in color. It did glint under the sunlight, which allowed me to make out details. Its scarred and battered exoskeleton. Its long yellow tusks coming from its lower jaw. Its segmented body curling as it rose from the hole in the earth. It had a single bulging eye embedded into its head, and three nostrils between that and its mouth. And coming out of either side of its body were its arms. They were fairly thick in width compared to the worm, giving the impression it was quite physically strong. Each arm was adorned with three-fingered hands, with worn claws extending from each finger, it didn't have thumbs. Looking back, they were probably meant for scraping through the dirt more than grabbing things. Long, sharp fins rose out of its back, going down the entire length of what I saw. This thing was massive. I have no doubts that it would have zero trouble wrapping around the entire Empire State Building if it wanted and it could probably dwarf the whole thing if it raised itself up as high as it could. It cast a massive shadow upon the ground behind it, and its gaze was focused squarely upon the sky. It braced itself against the rock formations, which makes me think it had trouble standing upright. Its entire lower jaw split vertically down the middle, and it drew its head back, taking in a breath for a solid five minutes. So much air was pulled in that I felt myself becoming short of breath, so I breathed in myself, the first thing I did that wasn't just sitting and staring in utter horror. It stopped, and then it held its breath for another minute, then thrust its head forward, and what came out was a roar that was simultaneously the loudest thing I've ever heard, and the quietest. I now know where the quakes come from. It's this thing, emerging from beneath the earth every ten years and unleashing this terrible shout for ten minutes straight. And it's so loud that it shakes the ground for the whole duration. Yet it's so high-pitched that you have to strain your ears to hear it. 
but once you pick it up, it becomes almost reflexive, and you're able to hear it without trying. It wasn't a pleasant sound either. The noise was dreadful in every capacity, sounding like every dying squeal you've heard from an animal meshed together and pitched up so far you can't hear it. It strikes me as odd that after a few years, I still remember it so vividly. I guess it's just one of those things you can't forget. After the allotted ten minutes, it stopped. It very slowly blinked, its eyelids closing vertically rather than horizontally, like you or I would. Then it turned its head, and I realized that it knew I was there. It removed a claw from the rock formations and bent over, planting it on the ground to support its weight. And then it did it with the other claw. It pulled itself towards me, twisting its head 180 degrees clockwise to angle the eye around to the ground, and hovered its head over me, and stared down at me for what felt like hours, though after looking at the footage, it was just a couple of minutes. I've never been more convinced that I was going to die, right then and there. This horrible thing from right out of a monster film was going to eat me or squash me or even breathe on me a little too hard and break all of my bones. If I ran, I would most certainly die. So I stayed put, hoping and praying to whatever god existed that this thing would decide to spare me. It eventually began to go back, rotating its head into the default position as it used its claws to push itself back towards the hole. It climbed back in, once more using its claws to brace itself against the formations. It gave another roar of the same length as last time, and then slipped back under the surface to return to whatever pit it called home. I sat there for over an hour as I regained my ability to move. Once I did, it very shakily got up, turned off the camcorder, got everything packed up, wolfed down some snacks, and went home. I didn't sleep that night. How could I? I just witnessed something horrible. Something I couldn't forget if I tried. I attended a local church the next morning. I've never been a religious fellow but I needed to feel there was someone out there better than that thing. Something that could give me an ounce of security. It hadn't killed me. For some reason, I was still alive. But the thought of the kind of damage it could do if it ever had a reason to go on some kind of horrible rampage haunted me for months after, and it still hasn't quite left my mind. Of course, the townsfolk seemed shaken as well. Two quakes instead of one. They were baffled, somewhat concerned, and when they saw me, they just assumed I was worse off than them over the same thing. Apparently, some accidents happened during the second roar. Thankfully, no one was seriously injured, but it still left some people jittery. I refused to release the tapes or even say exactly where I found it. Heck, this is the first time I've even mentioned it to anyone besides myself. But if somehow you know where this is, then do yourself a fucking favor and listen to me. Tell no one. Because if word gets out, it'll create a panic. And if there's a panic, the military is going to get involved, and they're going to try and kill it. And anyone who's watched any giant monster film knows exactly what will follow. You want to know the reason I don't like Godzilla films these days? It's because they remind me of what could actually happen. I'm the Cleaner by I Own Cows. So those that know me and know what I do call me the cleaner. I'm what you might call a bounty hunter, 
except I deal with very special cases, stuff that nobody else can really handle. I seek out the filth, the otherworldly beings, even what you might think is supernatural, and I terminate it. I don't discriminate, I don't hesitate. I just squeeze the trigger. I'm not open for hire. I only take contracts from one person. And no, I can't bring you into the fold. It's something you're born into, and there's only ever a handful of us alive at a time. I can't go too far into detail, but I'm allowed to say this. It all starts with a slip of paper, usually an envelope in the mail. Sometimes, though, in very rare cases, I will get a letter in person. I call her Star, she's not allowed to tell me her real name. And Star isn't her code name. Traditionally, someone like her would just be called a messenger. Nothing else, that is all they are. I call her Star, though. She has a really bright personality. Figured it fit. Now I'm going to share a story with you all. I'm not a really a storyteller, so you'll have to forgive me if the format is strange. But I'll let you in on my life. Peel back the curtain just a little. I had a... Well, a case a few years back. Started like I said, with a knock at the door, which always gets my heart pumping. You see, we cleaners don't have friends. We don't visit each other. So a knock at the door can only mean one thing. Star is there waiting with a special assignment. I unlock the deadbolt, grab the cold doorknob, and slowly edge the door open. There was Star, as expected, greeting me with a huge smile she always had on. Morning, Mr. Clean. How are you doing? She asked politely, moving her bangs out of her eyes. I returned the smile and motioned for her to enter. Still alive, so I'm doing better than most people I know. We made our way into the kitchen, and I poured her a glass of water, something I always did for the messenger. I'm going to take a wild guess and assume this isn't a social visit. I handed her the glass of water. Oh, thank you. She took the glass and sipped on the water before replying. You know, one of these days, I'm just going to pop by and hang out. It was a nice thought, but I knew it could never happen. It's against the rules, and no one breaks the rules. But you are right. She pulled an envelope from her back pocket. This one is going to be a toughie. There were two pictures. Usually. I only got one. She placed them on the table. The photos were of two monstrous-looking beasts, hairy and huge. I instantly recognized what they were and immediately got a pit in my stomach. Star must have noticed because she responded with a reassuring pat on the back. You can do it. They were lycanthropes, or more commonly known as werewolves. They're about as tough as it gets. Yeah... Probably. But two? Really? I shook my head inside. Am I to take them on alone? Yuppers. And we both know what that means. She paused to drink the water. They're mating. So we're going to need you to deal with this as quickly as possible. Can't be giving them a chance to separate and disappear. Lycanthropes are pretty much what they appear to be in the movies. Vicious. Strong. Fast. Practically the perfect killing machine. However, in real life, they don't have any special weakness. They die the same way as everything else, and the best way to do it is blood loss. Explosives work well too, but that can tend to get messy and you might blow yourself up. I prefer hit-and-run tactics. That's a problem when there's two, though. You have to severely injure both of them before they have a chance to rip you to shreds. It is preferred to take them out before they have a chance to morph. You've got a 50-50 on that, though. Normally, you won't see two in the same place because they are very territorial. I groaned. Fuck. All right, I'll do it. Give me two weeks, Tops. If I don't check in, I'm dead. Contact two if that happens. She can take over the case. I doubt it'll come to that. Star, as always, confident in my abilities. You always come out on top, one way or the other. I snickered. 
Yeah. Well, just give me the details. The sooner I plan this suicide mission, the better. I was awarded a laugh from Star. Yes, sir. So here's what we got. So, of course, I can't actually go into the details of the locations and the contacts we use in the area. All I can say is that the events went down in a town in the States. I'm sure the more curious of you will try to search for news reports and whatnot, but I promise that you're not going to find anything. Any shred of evidence that there was is gone. My family has been doing this for a very long time. We're a lot better at this than you are. You'll find nothing. Now, when a cleaner goes looking for information, there's really only one thing that can give you reliable facts. An imp. That's what we call them. They don't really have a name in the English language. They're half human, half I guess what you would call a demon. They're about as close to human as monsters can get. I know that may sound scary, but there's a reason we call them imps. They're small, weak, feeble creatures. The only thing they have going for them is their longevity, pretty much immortal. And only a handful of them are still living. So, being that they pose no threat, we don't put them on the kill list. Imps are good for one thing, and one thing only. Information gathering. Ins and outs, they know it all. And for a price, they'll tell you everything you need to know. So when I arrived at the small town, I arranged a meeting with the local imp, via my contacts. Naturally, he wanted to meet in a public place. The otherworldly aren't really trusting of us cleaners. It was the middle of the day when we met. I spotted him sitting on a bench, right in the middle of the park. To the average passerby, he might have just looked like a small, odd-looking middle-aged man, not worth more than two looks. I instantly noted the signs, however. Pointed left ear, hunched posture, one red eye and one blue eye. Imps all have the same disfigurement. They can easily blend in with contacts and what not, though. You might have even met one before without knowing it. I plopped down next to him. Mind if we cut to the chase, imp? The imp grunted and turned to face me, his thick brows already furrowed. You're all the same, you cleaners. Been dealing with you lot for over a century. Always impatient. Never enough time to chat, eh? He sighed deeply obviously not wanting to be there. I shrugged my shoulders. Sorry if I don't stop to ask you about the weather. I've got a job to do, and neither of us gets paid by the hour. Now tell me about the doggies. The imp looked at me, eyebrows still furrowed, notably displeased with my response. Hmm, well, treating them like dogs will definitely get you six feet under. I didn't respond, silently encouraging him to continue. There's two of them. They're young, maybe early mid-twenties. They're gonna be strong. You've got the upper hand with expertise, I would think. He paused as a mother and her rather chubby kid passed by. Three victims so far. But well, they were all human, so they won't be ready for something like you. He scratched his hairy chin and looked at me with his mismatched eyes. Female's name's Karen, and the other's Brandon. And where are Brandon and Karen staying? There's a lodge in the woods, east all the way back. They're on private property. They stay there on the weekends. He rubbed his eyes and yawned. Are we done yet? I need a nap. Last question. Why haven't they been caught yet? There's a lot of people missing. The imp was quick to respond. They only take homeless, people that won't be missed. Before I could ask anything else, he was up on his feet, hobbling away. Good luck, cleaner. You're gonna need it. Can't say that I'll miss you if you die. He cackled as he walked away. Charming creatures. He was right. I'd need all the luck. Killing one werewolf is difficult. Killing two approaches impossible. You have to plan, weigh the risks heavily, and hope it all goes smooth. And it has to go smooth. 
Bearing that in mind, I rested up, got familiar with the terrain, and eventually found myself hiking through the thickest parts of the forest a few days later. It was dark, not a single hint of moonlight was able to push its way through the thick canopy. I decided it would be better to take them out after daylight hours. By then they would have their next victim already, and the feast would already be underway. Werewolves are emotional creatures, so I could only hope that they were caught up in the ritual. Pitiful that I had to let a civilian die in the process. Not all hunts are without collateral damage. I reassured myself. It took about half an hour of wading through the thick trees before I started approaching a clearing. I could see the small cabin in the distance. At first glance, it was quite homely looking. Wooden walls, a fireplace smoking. Even a sign that said welcome. There was one thing that did break the illusion, however. The screams. The bone-chilling screams of a man whose flesh was being peeled from his bones. I could see him, laying on a table, arms and legs strapped down. A man and a woman standing over him. The man had a large blade and was slicing through his skin like it was butter. They were chanting in an old language, one that doesn't have a name. Their voices were guttural and a deeper pitch than humans were possible of making. It was the mating ceremony. They flay the victim alive, eat the skin, drain the blood into buckets, and then smear themselves in the blood. It was a sick and twisted ritual, and I didn't give them the chance to finish it. I looked down the iron sights of my rifle, picking my first target, the male, Brandon, the first shot ripped through the forest until it found its mark. The bullet tore through the man's chest, stopping his heart in an instant. Blood splattered onto the ground as he slumped to his knees and fell to his face. Karen reacted almost instantaneously and dashed behind the trees to the right of the house. I expected that, though. Werewolf reflexes were remarkable, even when in human form. I already knew what would happen next. She would change become the monster I was sent to kill. The werewolf transformation is a slow, excruciatingly painful process. So I have heard, at least. Bones grow and break to morph the body into a massive beast. Hair stabs through the skin, creating roots where none existed before. Their teeth all fall out one by one and are replaced by vicious fangs. Finger and toenails are pushed out, and in their place... Only sharp bones remain, twice as long, sharp and strong. Close quarter combat against them is, well, a terrible idea. Almost always fatal. I sighed and checked my surroundings. There were no signs of Karen. Maybe she... An abrupt inhuman screech tore through the forest. It was distant, but they were known for their ability to cover ground fast. Everything got quiet after that. Fuck. I could feel the tremor in my hand already. Her transformation was complete, and I had just killed her lover. Again, they are very emotional creatures. Passionate to their very core. I emptied the chamber of my rifle and pushed another round in. It wasn't human anymore. Slowly, I started making my way towards the lodge, taking care to not make the slightest of sounds. I was inching my way to the ritual table. Help me. I could hear the man croak out as I neared. They're going to kill me. Please, help me. His voice was getting weaker. I looked over his bloody mass of a body. Or at least what was left of it. You need to call. Call an ambulance. His breathing was more labored now, wheezing as his lungs fought for oxygen. I rested my hand on his forehead. It's going to be all right. Close your eyes. I'll take it from here. He tried to say something more, but his eyes slowly drifted shut, and his breathing eventually stopped. It was a shitty way to die. 
I let my eyes trail down to the other dead man. Brandon, the lycanthrope. He was young. Brown hair, blue eyes, and a hole in his chest. On the surface level, you can't even tell that they're not human. There's no giveaway like there is with the imps. Werewolves are hard to find. Unless, of course, they're morphed and hunting you. I nudged him with my boot. No movement. Good, I thought. I stepped over his body and moved towards their cabin. I had to shut myself in. I needed to trap the beast. I opened the door, slowly pushing it with my rifle, making sure to close it behind me. The fireplace was still lit, making the shadows dance on the walls. Very homely indeed, I said absentmindedly. And it was. There wasn't much to it, but it was nice. A sofa and a recliner by the fire. A kitchen past that. No TV, though. I looked back at the dead body outside. I guess they've got other interests. There were paintings on the walls, mostly of wolves and the such. Brandon's signature was on a few of them. I guess he was a painter when he wasn't busy being a werewolf. Another screech tore through the forest, much closer this time. It was stalking the tree line, deciding how to attack. I snapped back to the task at hand. Right, let's get to it. I needed to immobilize the beast. I smiled as I dropped my duffel back to the floor and set aside two larger bear traps. Even a lycanthrope can't ignore steel teeth biting to its bones. I placed one by the door, maybe five feet apart, and one by the window next to the fireplace. I saw what to do. I waited. And waited. Three hours went by before I heard it again. The beast was smart to wait that long. I was tired and the recliner was definitely helping me to fall asleep, especially with the warmth of the fire. However, the second I heard it, my adrenaline kicked into overdrive. It was circling the house, heavy footfalls making solid thuds. It made no attempt to hide its presence, growling every other breath. Werewolves were masters at stalking their prey. You can only hear them when they want you to. It's no wonder she was able to get to the house without me noticing. She wanted me intimidated, and I was. I could hear the slow scraping of her talons as she carved into the house. The low guttural growl as she grew bolder with each step. Boom! The cabin shook violently as something smashed against it. Paintings fell from the walls. My body trembled and then it got quiet. No more footsteps. No more growling. It was in kill mode. Shit. Every hair in my body was at attention. Goosebumps rose on my arms and the tremor in my hand returned. All the experience in the world can't save you from the terror of a pissed off lycanthrope. I took a deep breath and slowly stood from the chair rifle in hand. I doused the fire and positioned myself in the center of the room, equal distance to either of the traps. With the fire out it was dark, and hopefully, it wouldn't see the bear traps. You will die! It was a deep, almost demonic thing to hear a werewolf talk. Before I could react, the beast burst through the front door, I had to duck as the door flew past my head and crashed into the kitchen. There wasn't much light, but I could see enough. Maybe eight feet tall, black fur, several hundred pounds. It was frightening. Muscles bulging, eyes glaring, fangs bared. It was pissed. At me. I couldn't afford to waste a second, though. I raised the rifle and opened fire. Shot after shot, three times I fired on the beast. The attack barely phased it as it only walked closer. The bullets ripped through its body, and the blood slowly leaked out, coating the monster with a crimson glow. But it didn't care. They're tough. I just had to buy time. Wait for it to step into the trap. That's it, come and get me! I shouted, squeezing the trigger once more. The bullet hit its ear and the beast roared in anger. 
Just one more step and I had the monster. Yeah, that... It stopped right in front of the trap and leaned forward so that its head was in the moonlight. Ears flat against its wolf-like skull, gray eyes staring down as it bared its fangs at me. <laughs> it flung the bear trap to the side, causing it to clatter against the wall and snap shut. No! It roared menacingly, and before I could react, it lunged at me, clearing the distance in one leap. It swatted me like a fly and sent me crashing into the fireplace. I hit hard and nearly cracked my skull open on the brick. The sharp claws had sliced through my vest like butter and gashed me open. Everything was blurry and my head felt like it was swimming in circles. I managed to push myself off the ground. I was greeted with another ear-splitting screech. I felt my eardrums pop as I fell back against the fireplace. Even from across the room I could feel how hot its breath was and the smell. It reeked of death. However, I couldn't afford not to act. I reached for the pistol on my belt and I opened fire again. I was dazed, but I got lucky. The bullet hit it in the head. It wasn't enough to kill it, not by a long shot, but it gave me a chance to move. I could see it fall back and break the small dining table I was next to. I was disoriented, and I used that to make my way to the window. I stumbled as I walked, almost falling on the trap I had set earlier. I lifted the glass pane and threw myself onto the window sill. I let my body slowly slide out the other side. I needed to put distance back between us, formulate a new plan. Fuck! My ankle erupted in pain. I could hear an audible pop as the werewolf crushed my bone in its grip, whilst also digging its sharp claws into my skin. It had caught my leg just as I was slipping out the window. You fucking bitch! I shouted. My entire leg felt as though it was on fire. I was in a bad spot, more or less dangling out of the window. I could see its head halfway sticking out of the window now. <laughs> I fired multiple rounds into its jaw, not giving it a chance to finish a sentence. The beast jerked its head back, smashing the top of the window as it did. I felt my ankle slip from its grip and my head smash onto the ground as I fell to the grass. I couldn't stand. My vision was fading, and the last thing I could hear was the beast pounding on the walls. <sighs> I groaned as I sat forward. I was alive, but only barely. I was in a puddle of my own blood, and I couldn't use my left leg. It took me nearly ten minutes to stand another few to hobble over to the cabin window. What was left of it, anyway. Karen the werewolf was seemingly dead. I leaned myself against the wall and peered inside. From what I could see, it looked as though the beast had bled out. Several bullet wounds, a bear trap still clamped on its ankle. Guess you stepped on it right before you snatched my leg. Even large pieces of glass sticking out from the back of its head. Looks like you dare trying to break the wall down, though. I pulled my burner out of my pocket and dialed my only contact. Mission is a success. Gonna need a clean-up crew and a pickup for myself. Oh, and bring Helga. I'm hurt pretty bad. I let myself slide down against the wall. Drifted off, looking at the stars. They looked especially dull that night. Took me a few days to wake up from that. Spent even longer in recovery. Witch doctors can only get you so far. That's the story for now, though. You don't have to believe me, but I assure you, some of the legends of old are true. I might post again. I've got plenty to tell. For now, though, I've got business to attend to. If you break down in a Slovakian forest, stay in your car. Imagine this, a bumpy hill road in the middle of nowhere. 
The forest is so thick and overgrown that even on a clear Sunday morning, you need to keep your headlights on. The trees tower high above you and extend everywhere you can see. A hundred years ago, these dark hills were a complete mystery to the local population. And they still are. Now there's just a poorly kept road leading through them. Also, imagine this. A bad hangover. The type of hangover that comes with overindulging in plump schnapps of questionable origin. You feel your eyes pressing against the back of your skull. The concept of enjoying food without dry heaving seems like something you'll be able to experience late next week. Your mouth is a burnt-down distillery that is being co-opted as a storage space for stubbed-out cigarettes. Everything sucks, and it sucks hard. Now combine the two. That's where I was, sitting in the back of a car riding through tight turns on a road so rustic that I felt like I was in the sweaty bowels of an ill-medicated epileptic. The radio kept on indecisively stepping between a Slovakian fire and brimstone preacher, kooky Hungarian folk music, and the sharp hush of static. Next to me, with his big head pressed against the window, Juraj snored with a type of intensity that usually requires medical intervention. Snoring was far from pleasant, but it was significantly better than the alternative. Juraj was just as hungover as I was, but where my fear of puking was purely hypothetical, his was a looming threat over the sanctity of the car. As soon as Juraj passed out and stopped crinkling the plastic bag on his lap, I felt considerably safer. Both Juraj and me were far too hungover to drive. Peter was behind the wheel. Even though the man was stone-cold sober and didn't touch a single drink last night, I didn't feel particularly safe with him driving either. He kept his finger wrapped around the steering wheel and refused any of my attempts at small talk, but I knew he wasn't really thinking about the road. Peter was a wreck. So was Juraj. Taking them out to the cabin was a mistake my wife had anticipated the moment I announced the trip. It's just a guy's week off. Those two need some fresh air and distraction. What could go wrong? Are you sure you know what you're getting into? You rarely know them outside of work. I have a sneaking suspicion you might be biting off more than you can chew. Forty-eight hours later, riding through the dark forest with a body drained of anything resembling joy, I found myself agreeing with my wife. I was just happy that I would be home in less than three hours, if the D1 highway would be kind to us. <coughs> the congestion on the D1 quickly became irrelevant. <coughs> I was scared of Jirai puking on me or Peter driving us off a cliff, but the betrayal came from a wholly unexpected source. My car. A reliable companion of over a decade was undone by a slight uncomfortable incline. <coughs> What's happening? Peter's broken-hearted trance was cracked by our sudden stop. Is this... Shit, shit, shit! The car started to slide backwards. Before we knew it, we were off the road with the front of the vehicle peeking out of a ditch and the back bumper intimately acquainted with a tree. Ugh. Jedi woke. Well, after impact. Ugh. He said. Assessing the situation... Then he vomited in the plastic bag he'd been clutching the whole way from the cabin. The damage was worse than expected. The engine had petered out on our way up the hill, but a bad engine can sometimes be persuaded to carry you to the nearest gas station on faith alone. What made any chance at a return to civilization nil was that our meeting with the tree caused one of the wheels to dislodge. There was no way to attach it back. The lug nuts were elsewhere, probably causing an overzealous squirrel terrible pain elsewhere in the forest. So there we were, stuck in a forest darker than sin in a car smelling of puke. My phone was out of battery, Peter's cell was sitting at 9%, and Jirai didn't believe in phones. Luckily my insurance was quick to contact a tow truck. Unluckily, the closest one in my network was about a 6 to 8 hours away. The air outside of the car made the situation considerably more bearable. 
Somewhere beyond the trees, there was a heat wave burning up the country, but in the shade of the woods it was almost chilly. Almost. The air in the forest was perfect. It also didn't smell like vomit, which was a big plus. Jere got out of the car after me and emptied out the plastic bag a good ten meters away. The guy stumbled his way through the shrubbery, occasionally having to hold a sluggish body against a tree or two. I appreciated the courtesy. What I didn't appreciate is him stuffing the bag into the pocket of his shorts. Might puke again, Jirai said when he noticed me noticing. When I told my wife Jirai had just gotten out of a six-year relationship, she was surprised he ever had one to begin with. After the cabin weekend, so was I. The forest was completely silent. All that could be heard was the rustling of trees from that ever-so-gentle breeze. It was nice. Almost. The stillness of the woods had made our lack of things to talk about much more apparent. So, this, uh, kinda sucks. Yeah. Should we, uh, go check on Peter? Yeah. Peter was still sitting in the driver's seat, slumped over and staring off into the trees. He was back to thinking about the phone call he had received last night. He was back to thinking about Bara. My knock on the window startled him. Hey, Peter. I think me and Jere are going to wait on the road to see if we can get someone to give us a ride to the gas station or something. Want to join? It's Sunday morning. It's Slovakia. We're in the middle of nowhere. There won't be any cars. Yeah. The scent of puke and distillates drifted by me. Pizza right. No cars today. So what, we just sit here for six hours doing nothing? I guess so, yeah. Maybe eight, Peter added. That's where I was, stuck in the middle of a forest with someone who had just gotten out of a six-year relationship, and someone who had been an accessory to a failing affair. All with a hangover to boot. Did you hear that? Peter's expression suddenly changed. He got out of the car and turned towards the forest, his brow furrowed in focus. I heard it. A sweet song of gentle melancholy came from the darkest part of the woods. The words were completely foreign to me, but there was something within the music that spoke to me. There was something in the song of the forest that wanted me to get closer. Women singing, Jure said. Should we go look? Obviously not. I said out of reflex. Back when my grandmother was around, back when the cabin in the woods was hers, she told me stories. Stories of the forest and the creatures that dwell within it. Of dumb travelers who ended up where they were not meant to be. I didn't recall anything specific about sweet songs in dark forests, but I wasn't planning on taking any chances. Yeah, should probably stay with the car. Wouldn't want to bump into a bear or something, Peter said. It does sound mighty nice, though. The song was, indeed, beautiful. I was still feeling like a walking corpse, but the sweet voices coming from the darkness were a balm to my tired soul. With the trees shivering above us and the gentle gust of the wind, things seemed peaceful. What would you guys do in my position? Peter asked, breaking the peace. With the whole Barath situation, I mean... Forget, Forget about, about her. her. We responded in unison for the tenth time. Jirai was sulky about his heartbreak, but he stayed silent about it. Peter felt the need to discuss it during any lolling conversation. The guy had been seeing a girl for a good six months until he found out she wasn't exactly single. Upon finding out this information, Peter gave Bara an ultimatum. Him or the other guy. She said she needed a month to decide. After a month, she came back with a counter-proposal. She would leave her boyfriend. In three months. I was pretty sure I could let it go, but I don't know. After she called me last night. Look, maybe she doesn't want to ruin the guy's summer. They've been together for two years. That's a really long time. Bara is a nice person. Sometimes it really gets in the way. Two years is not a long time, Jirai said. His tone could sharpen steel. 
And Bara is not a nice person. She's a manipulative b- Hey, you guys want to check out the singing? The words left my mouth without warning. Deep inside, I knew it was a bad idea, but I couldn't stand being witness to another discussion about Bara's personality or how incomprehensible the pain of a six-year relationship ending is. In a moment of weakness, I let myself forget about my grandmother's stories. What could go wrong? I thought. I have a sneaking suspicion you might be biting off more than you can chew. Yeah, sounds good. As we walked through the forest, Peter sang praises of Bara's kindness, but no one listened. Eventually, perhaps, remembering the attitudes of his audience, he went quiet. The snapping of twigs beneath our feet was soon overtaken by the sweet angelic music. Somewhere beneath those beautiful foreign words, there was a bubbling brook. All that stood in our way was a thorny bush. The memory of my grandma's wrinkled hand shot across my mind like cannon fire. Guys, I said, on second thought this might not be the best idea. Something real bad could be hiding behind that bush. Maybe we should just get back in the car? It is kind of crazy, Jure said. You're probably right. Peter stayed silent. He just stood there, staring at the shrubbery, lost in the gentle words of the song. Then, without looking at either of us, he crossed the thorny threshold. The song stopped. It was replaced by a group of women laughing. Jure gave me an inquisitive look. I shrugged. He took the plastic bag deeper into his shorts before he went through the bushes. There were four of them, each more beautiful than the last. As soon as they saw Jure and me, they started laughing even harder playfully pushing each other around and trying to hide their nakedness. They weren't doing such a good job. Oh, how embarrassing, the tallest of them said, laughing like a giddy schoolgirl. You have found us bathing and we have nothing to hide ourselves with. Peter laughed, a laugh so nervous, it made my stomach do a flip. Don't worry, he said. It is us who should apologize. We've intruded upon you. It is us who should apologize. Look at those tits, Jure whispered to me, way too loudly. This got another laugh from the stunning quartet. They clearly weren't human. They stood on two legs and had bodies more tempting than anything that could be found with high-speed internet. But the creatures standing in the stream clearly weren't human. Their skin was a swampy green... On their heads, they wore messy locks of hay grass, and beneath their navels lay cleanly trimmed tufts of moss. Even though their eyes resembled those of a fish, the creatures regarded us with gazes full of sex. They clearly weren't human, but in that moment it didn't seem to matter. All that mattered was their unearthly beauty. I found my thumb caressing the edge of my wedding ring. I stopped immediately. My wife would kill me if she found out I tried fucking some mysterious forest creature. Well, uh, ladies, sorry to interrupt your bath time. Me and my friends should probably get going. I took a step backward, hoping that Jirai and Peter would follow. They didn't. Nonsense, the most voluptuous of the creatures said. We rarely get visitors in these parts, especially not ones as handsome as you three. Please, let us treat you to a meal in our humble abode. I could use a bite, Jere said. We would be honored to join you for a meal. My friends did a fair amount of drinking last night, and I'm sure they would appreciate some food. We were riding through the forest, and I... We... Peter's face went red. We are waiting for a tow truck. The quartet of vixens giggled once more. Their laughter was beyond pleasing, but in the back of my head I could sense my wife's judgmental gaze. My grandma's shaking hands were pulling me back to the car. Guys, I don't know. Maybe we should just go back to the road and wait for- There is one little problem, said the creature on the right, who made the bare minimum effort to contain her breasts. Oh yes, a little problem, the one on the left, who made no effort to cover herself at all. We live in the forest and have no clothes, they said in unison. 
nor do we wish to wear any. We hope you don't mind, said the tall one. We're free spirits out here. Don't worry about it, we're all modern here. We have no problem with nudity, said Peter, still blushing. I'm a free spirit too, said Jurey. When the creatures of the pond stopped covering themselves, he nudged me in the rib, just in case I didn't notice. I noticed. Feel free to stare, said the voluptuous one. It would be a shame to see the forest's gifts go to waste. They walked beside us through the forest. At first it felt as if we were just randomly stepping through bushes, but the longer we walked, the more I noticed a path starting to form beneath our feet. The voluptuous one slipped her hand into Dre's. He didn't resist, in the least. It didn't take long for the nervous small talk to descend into both Jure and Peter, talking about their freshly ended loves. After spending 48 hours with the two, I figured every social interaction inevitably led to that. The way that the two spoke of their past loves on their forest paths, however, was different. Jure suddenly became the instigator of the breakup. He knew full well that the girl he was with was a bad match for him. She was too traditional, too sucked up in the machine. He wanted to end it before it got too serious. At no point did Jure mention his marriage proposal and how unfair it is she changed her mind. Peter also told a radically different story. Bara wasn't a one-of-a-kind or living goddess. She was just some girl who cheated on her boyfriend with Peter. Now she was getting clingy. She was going to break up with her boyfriend for him, and Peter was not interested in anything long-term. Last night, he called Bara to check up on her, and she threw a giant fit on the phone that lasted multiple hours. The two well-endowed vixens didn't question any of the story. They fawned over him, calling him a treasure. Soon enough, the three of them were walking in a friendly embrace. You're a really good friend, the tall one said, bending down ever so slightly. Her voice dripped through my being like caramel. She smelled like a spring meadow after a thunderstorm. Her lips were millimeters away from my ear. It sounds like these boys barely know you, yet you offered to sit with them in their hour of need. That's very noble of you. Noble men are hard I have a wife and we're married and we own a dog together. My reflexive yelp made the tall one laugh. She backed off, but as we walked through the forest, her hand kept on brushing up against mine. I tried to imagine her hands were wrinkly and covered in scars of old age. I couldn't. Her skin was softer than silk. I let go of her hand when I saw the cave. Hey, we really appreciate your invitation, but we really shouldn't be going into caves right now. There's no phone signal in there. What if the tow truck came earlier? Guys, we should turn back. No response. They all just kept on walking. The tall one walked a little slower. Her hips swayed like a sexy pendulum. She shot me a look with those piercing amber eyes of hers. I hated myself for it. My wife would castrate me for it. But I followed. The entrance was pitch dark, but within a few steps the cavern lit up in a flurry of dim colors. All around us, creatures just as beautiful as our forest companions danced around glowing crystals. There was something within those crystals, something that moved but it was impossible to pay attention to it. My eyes were glued to the sensual performance. The way those creatures moved, the way they pressed themselves up against the crystals, I found myself toying with my wedding ring again. Past the glowing spacious cavern, there was a small stone chamber lit with candles. A roughly chiseled table extended from the ground with three tree trunks before it. See it. The voluptuous one sat, leading Jure to the table. Sit and wish for whatever food your heart most desires. Eat your fill and drink to your heart's content. Once your stomachs have been satisfied, we will have a surprise for you. Dobro hoch. The large-breasted creatures sang as they fought for a spot on Peter's lap. He let them both sit. They still playfully shoved each other, fighting over Peter's attention. Peter enjoyed that. 
There was nothing on the side of the table just moments prior, but somehow, in the flicker of the candlelight, two paper bags materialized. They bore the unmistakable logo of Pavel's Bistro. The sight of the double Chipotle cheeseburger was mouth-watering, but I needed something more. My hungover stomach demanded a meal of pure meat and grease. A pork knuckle, glistening straight from the oven. Next to it lay a mug of frothy beer. I leaped at the cutlery, starving to cut off a chunk of meat. The moment my hands touched the knife, however, the tall one slid into my lap. She grabbed the utensils from me and started carving the meat herself. You've done enough already. Let me feed you. Her gentle lips brushed against my ear. You can stay as long as you want. After lunch, I have a special surprise for you. No one should spend his weekend with two heartbroken boys and not be rewarded for it. Her buttocks wiggled as she moved the dripping fork towards my mouth. The meat smelled of smoke and honey. When the soft flesh entered my mouth, I, for a second, felt utter, undeniable bliss. But then something sharp cut across my mind. I have a sneaking suspicion you might be biting off more than you can chew. I spit out the meat and got up. This barely phased Peter and Jure. Even the tall creature didn't seem particularly angry. Are you not hungry? She said, with a sheepish look on her face. Jure, Peter, we need to leave right now. My words had no effect on my friends. In fact, they only seemed to embolden the forest creatures sitting on their laps. Dre and Peter were still gnawing on their burgers, but their companions were starting to kiss their necks and caress their bodies. I yelled once more, but when I heard the groan of a zipper being unzipped without complaint, I backed out of the room. There was nothing I could do. All around me the green succubi were still dancing around the glowing crystals, but they no longer regarded the stones with love and admiration. They were staring at me. All traces of erotic temptation disappeared beneath a wave of furious fish eyes. It was only then that I was able to focus on the shapes that moved inside the crystals. Men. Desperate men with rough hair and overgrown beards slammed at the edges of their colorful prisons. They wanted the forest creatures to pay attention to them. They were hypnotized by their beauty, just like my friends. Oh, don't leave just yet, the tall one said, swaying towards me. With just a few long steps, she was standing next to me. Our hands quickly met. Her eyes were filled with love. She forgave me for spitting out the food and making a scene. All she wanted was for me to return to the table and relax. She pressed herself against me. The tapping of the crystals around us hushed down. It seemed like a cosmic sin not to kiss her in that moment. Reality dimmed down to nothing but our body heat. Yet I did not kiss her. The poet in me wants to believe that I resisted because of my grandmother's stories. Another part of me wants to blame it on the fact I felt her tug on my wedding ring. But if I really think about it, it was because of her teeth. Behind those beautiful lips, there were rows of sharp, long daggers. She was a malevolent spirit of the forest. I craved to be with her, but if I were to accept her kiss, I knew I would never return home. She meant me harm. The tall one wanted to take me away from my wife, so I punched her hard enough in the nose to get blood on my fist. Blue and viscous with the shimmer of glitter, I didn't have time to examine the forest creature's blood. The cave roared with the sound of slammed crystal walls once again. The tall one's kin were descending upon me. I ran. I ran through the crowd of vixens, tearing away from their gentle grasps, dodging their heavenly bodies. I ran out of the cave with such fervor that by the time I was back inside of the car, my escape had cost me a shoe, my phone, and a good chunk of my shirt. The whole sprint felt like a heart attack, but it wasn't until I was locked inside of my three-wheeled car that I felt like I might need an ambulance. According to the dashboard clock, we'd spent well over six hours with those swamp women. 
For a good thirty minutes I sat in the car, hyperventilating about what I would do after sundown, and with no help. Yet my terrified prayers were answered with a little orange light from the side of the road. The tow truck guy was pissed off to be working on a Sunday, and the fact that Peter wasn't picking up his phone only amplified the fury. I didn't tell him about the forest creatures. Pretty sure he would have swung at me if I did. No, I just stayed quiet in the back of the tow truck and got a motel near the repair shop. It was a long ride, and the tow truck guy spent every minute of it yelling about politics, so I wasn't able to get any sleep. The second my head touched the motel bed, I blacked out. In the morning, it took me a moment to fully understand where I was and what had happened. The previous day's events coming into my memory didn't make anything any clearer. For a moment, I considered finding some sort of way to get back into the woods to help Jure and Peter. But I was certain I wouldn't be able to say no to the tall one again. Plus, I knew that my wife would be worried about me. The guy at the auto shop wasn't the least bit helpful about when my car would be fixed, so I grabbed the quickest train back home. The question of Jure and Peter's fate had to wait. The dog seemed to be a lot more excited about my arrival than my wife. She was angry, but she still hugged me tighter than ever before. I was meant to come back almost two days ago. I wasn't picking up my phone. She almost called the police. By the time we opened a bottle of wine, she seemed more worried than angry. Before I got a chance to tell her what had happened with Peter and Jure, her phone rang. She was finally getting an answer to her 56 missed calls, but I was in the room with her. She listened to the phone for a second and then passed it to me. It was Jure and Peter. Their voices were animated, filled with more energy than I had heard all weekend. They had found my phone near the cave and charged it at a gas station that was a bit of a hike from the woods. They were calling me to tell me they're fine. Within a minute of both of them starting going into detail of how much fun they were having with their new forest friends, putting them on speakerphone without giving any context to my wife. Jure and Peter shrugged off all of the questions that they were put under some sort of spell, that they were being used. Apparently, they were having the time of their lives. It wasn't until I mentioned that I'm considering calling the police that they started to take me seriously. They said they weren't breaking any laws. They said they were staying in the cave of their free will. They begged me not to take away their happiness. So I didn't. Instead, once we got off the phone and I explained the matter to my wife, I tried to contact Bara and Jure's ex fiance Bara seemed wholly uninterested in my messages, but Jure's ex actually went out to look for him. Even though my wife only heard a strategically redacted version of our forest adventure, she was fully committed to finding out how the situation would be resolved. Every day, she asked me whether Jure's ex had found anything out, anything new about the potentially imprisoned duo. When the phone call finally came in, we both listened intently on the speakerphone, but were overwhelmed. Jure's ex had picked him up from the side of the road and sat down with him in a gas station cafe. Apparently, he was in desperate need of a haircut and his clothes smelled terrible, but aside from that, he was happier than she had ever seen him. He assured her he was doing great in his new cave life. He wouldn't listen to reason and insisted he would take great personal offense if she called the cops. After their talk, Jure's ex dropped him off back at the edge of the forest and then decided to drop the matter entirely and move on with her life. She suggested we do the same. I called them back a couple times from my wife's phone. Weeks later, Jure and Peter still insisted they were having the time of their life. They also insisted in describing in detail the acts that their new lifestyle involved. They spoke with the gentlest of lisps, and their capacity to pick up on other topics of conversation aside from sex had diminished considerably. They started suggesting I visit them. Soon enough, they demanded it. It was during these feverish sales pitches that the voices suddenly disappeared. Someone else took the phone. 
someone with a voice like a gentle spring breeze. She said she wasn't angry about me punching her in the face. She said that we all get nervous sometimes. She still had my shoe. Sometimes, on the nights when she couldn't stop thinking about me, she smelled it. She was waiting. That night, I let myself indulge in the ecstasy of the tall one's voice. I rode my phone's battery all the way until its bitter end. Yet in the morning, I deleted the number. I knew that if I could call her whenever I wished, if I could let myself surrender to the tall one's influence whenever life got too difficult, I would end up just like Jure and Peter did. The inability to contact her would make her absence bearable. The moment I deleted the number, I decided to take a page out of Bara's book and pretend nothing had ever happened. I live in hopes that my longing for the strange creature will eventually subside, and it will be buried beneath the commitments of my marriage, of more dogs, of kids. Yet, just in case it doesn't work out with my wife, I keep a little mental snapshot of where my old car breathed its last breath. If my marriage goes to crap, I wouldn't mind taking a bumpy ride down a rustic forest road. The Minotaur of Stag Creek by Ganymedes the banshee shriek and strobing lights of the cruiser died down as Officer Hank Lewis switched off the ignition. The journey was far from pleasant. The damn vehicle had almost surrendered to the stubborn, gluttonous mud that led up the road. With a grunt filled with both frustration and relief, Lou swung the door open and hauled himself out of the car, slamming the door with a hollow thud. Officer J. Bradshaw climbed from the other side. He was a wiry fellow, a Brit, with a look of apprehension on his face. Louis didn't blame him. In truth, he didn't exactly want to be there either. Louis wiped a sheen of sweat from his brow. He reached for his radio, which ran on one of those new armor systems, and flicked on the receiver. Dispatch, this is MB-32A-1097. We're at the scene. Copy that, MB-32. Anything of note? As he gazed up at the old wooden fence, covered in graffiti and lichen, Luz shook his head. Nothing. The radio went silent as he stepped forward. A sign affixed to the fence, faded with age, read, Welcome to Stag Creek Woods. Beyond the fence, the woods started, a mass of green and brown and black, a wilderness of trees and shrubbery. He took a deep breath. To his right, Bradshaw stood silently, waiting. Luz looked at him, and with a nod turned on his flashlight. He pushed open the old gate, rotten, damp and unpleasant to the touch, and held it open. Once the two of them were through, Luz let it swing shut behind him. Luz felt uncomfortable somehow. A feeling of unease crept through him, part nyctophobia, part claustrophobia. He was used to the well-lit streets, not a pitch-black woodland. By all accounts, neither of them should have been there in the first place. Unfortunately for Luz, the rural division had been short-staffed, and naturally, he and Bradshaw had been lumbered with the job. Now they were paying the price. At least there were other officers in the area, while Luz and Bradshaw were operating primarily in the west, three other groups were stationed in different corners of the woods. Canine units were operating elsewhere, but neither of them had the luxury of a dog. The outer parts of the woodland, like the fence that surrounded it, were littered with missing posters. Luz shone his light over them, despite already knowing the details. He didn't know why. Maybe it was some way of trying to distract himself from his surroundings. The photograph was rather low in quality. And then again, the whole thing was. It depicted a relatively young woman, brunette and heavyset, identified as Gina Montgomery by the bold typeface at the bottom. There was a Winchester rifle slung over her shoulder, 
a hunter, Lewis observed. Come on, Bradshaw said. We've got time to stare at the bloody posters, let's go. They continued on their path, Bradshaw up ahead. As the two of them took their first steps into the woodland, the missing posters grew sparser, until one remained and the trees were bare. Stag Creek Forest was an eerie place at night. Occasionally, a shadowy shape would appear against the beam of the flashlight. Every single time, Luz realized that it was nothing but a raccoon, or a skunk, or something of that nature. He had a near miss with a skunk after about a half an hour, and narrowly avoided a snake right after that. There was wildlife everywhere, and that posed quite a problem. If the two of them found a body, and Luz strongly hoped they wouldn't find a body, chances were that scavengers would get to it before they did. No use worrying about it, though. Not yet. Luz decided to just keep going and hope for the best. Luz shone his beam straight down and spotted something on the ground. There were indentations in the leaf litter, regular and far too big to have been made by raccoons. Hey, he said. Take a look at this. Bradshaw turned around and looked at the tracks. He bent down and examined them properly. Footprints, he said, stating the obvious. How fresh do you think they are? I'd say, he thought about it, a couple of days. Time frame adds up. Let's keep moving. He followed Bradshaw as he moved further into the woods. There was a strong sense of deja vu about it. They hadn't been here before, obviously, or at least Luz himself hadn't. But there was a dim familiarity to it. Of course there was. Luz had grown up around forests, but that didn't mean being in unfamiliar woodland during the night was any easier. He still felt very vulnerable. This place gives me the creeps already, muttered Luz. Silence. There was no response from Bradshaw. All Luz heard now were the chirps of crickets. Jay? Nothing. Jay Bradshaw had spotted something on a tree. As he passed by, he thought little of it. Only when he'd passed it did he stop to think. His curiosity had gotten the better of him, and he'd gone back to check it out. Looking at the tree, a big Sitka spruce, Bradshaw scrutinized its bark. There were deep gashes in the wood, deep enough to tear through the cambium layer, Chunky sap oozed from it like blood from a wound. At the tree's base lay branches that looked to have been snapped off by some powerful force. The first thought Bradshaw had was that it was a bear. He could only make out three claw marks, and each seemed to be oriented in the wrong direction. That was no bear. He turned and opened his mouth to say something to Lewis, but there was no sign of him. Furring his brow... Bradshaw yelled. Luz! There was no answer. He tried again, but again got no reply, and heard only crickets. Fumbling around in his belt, Bradshaw withdrew his radio. He tried Lewis' channel, but received only static. Switching channels, he spoke. Dispatch, this is MB-32B. I got separated from MB-32A. I'm near a big Sitka spruce. Rough location is Stag Creek Forest. Over. There was silence from the other end. Over the din of the radio, Luz could make out the sound of rustling leaves and snapping branches. A moment later, the voice of the dispatcher broke the silence. MB-32B, have you attempted to contact MB-32A? Twice so far. No response. Over. Copy that. Keep us updated and keep trying to re-establish contact. Understood. Bradshaw slotted the radio back into its holster. Damn it, Hank, where are you? He turned away from the mangled tree trunk and continued. About five minutes after leaving the Sitka spruce, something appeared in Bradshaw's periphery. He spun around. Loose? There was no reply. Whatever it was carried on unperturbed. Some sort of animal, maybe. 
He raised his flashlight and shone it on the vegetation nearby. It moved. Bradshaw furrowed his brow and walked a little closer, but not too far. A sharp screech came from the bush barely three feet from his ear. He swung the flashlight and chuckled. It was a raccoon. Son of a bitch. He watched the bewildered animal as it disappeared into the night. Luz had decided to press on, following the tracks. Bradshaw would catch up eventually. He was sure of it. After a while, he decided to sit down on an old mossy log, and there he waited. But there was no sign. Eventually, he got up. If he couldn't find Bradshaw, and if Bradshaw wasn't going to come to him, he tried to track down one of the other officers. A burst of static interrupted his thoughts, and he could barely make out what was being said. Radio check. MB-32A, do you copy? He fumbled in his belt and pulled out his radio. Reading you loud and clear, dispatch. Over. Any contact with the MB-32B? He's looking for you. You haven't heard a bloody thing. Over. A pause. Do you know your location? Is there anyone else in the vicinity? I, uh... Luz got to his feet and shone his flashlight around. I haven't the faintest clue. As far as I know, I'm the only officer in the sector. Over. Copy that. The radio clicked. Luz glanced behind him, shining his flashlight into the darkness, and again saw nothing. He set off, continuing to follow the footprints. He wanted to back out, but alone or otherwise, he still had a job to do. For a while, a Hank Luz walked on, until the sound of rushing water reached his ears. Shining his flashlight up ahead, he saw the ground abruptly drop off. Must be Stag Creek, Luz thought to himself as he walked closer. His approach confirmed his suspicions. Stag Creek was relatively wide, a tributary of the Eel River. The banks were surrounded by rocks, and the water level was low. Most of the riverbed was filled with sludge and silt. Beneath the surface were countless boulders and submerged logs, and it stank to high heaven. Rotten eggs. That was the closest approximation Lewis could find. The smell was that of rotten eggs. He narrowed his eyes. What the hell? What could be causing that in the middle of the woods? Sewage? But as Luz stood there, the scent seemed to fade. The rattle of gunfire rang out from somewhere in the woods. Luz's head turned. He saw a bright flashlight through the distant trees. As he took a step towards the source of the noise, they were replaced by something else. The wind now carried with it the sound of screaming. And the yelping of dogs. His gun held in a white-knuckled grip, Luz walked slowly backwards towards the creek. He was only dimly aware of his footing as he slipped in the mud. All thoughts dissipated and he felt the tug of gravity winning over. He felt a sharp pain in his left calf as he fell. He landed face down at the bottom of the embankment. Screwing his eyes shut, he pushed himself clear of the sludge. He coughed hard and fumbled for his pistol reassured by the sensation of the grip on his handle. Luz climbed to his feet slowly, shakily. Opening his eyes, at last, he looked down at himself. There was a big tear in his calf, a gash, blood. Luz gritted his teeth. Fucking hell, he said to nobody in particular. It wasn't too bad, a flash wound at best. But the risk of infection was there. Suddenly he felt vulnerable. The scent of blood would carry. Reaching into his duty belt, he withdrew a tourniquet and started to apply it. It was a slapdash job, but it would do the trick. Once that was done, he reached for his radio. A sinking feeling crept over Luz when he felt it. It was very clearly broken. Ah, crap. Feeling his leg wound gingerly, Luz grimaced. A thought crossed his mind. The squad car. There were probably still some band-aids in there. If he could just get back to it, he'd be in the clear. 
Luz began walking, but paused after only a moment. His gaze landed on something on the other side of the creek. Furrowing his brow, he walked closer. The footprints started up again on the opposite bank, but this time they were irregular. The track maker had fallen, and Luz noted they hadn't been lucky. Probably twisted an ankle or something, but as he started following the tracks, Luz's eyes landed on something else. More tracks, a totally different shape. Hoofprints. They looked like those of a moose, but they couldn't have been. There were no moose in California, let alone Humboldt County. Without breaking stride, Luz began to follow the tracks. The thought of calling for help passed through Bradshaw's head. But he decided against it. It wasn't out of pride or anything, more so the opposite, a refusal to admit to anyone that he was lost. Sighing, Bradshaw continued to walk. And that was when the sounds hit him. His first thought was it sounded like gunfire. His second was that it was gunfire. Turning his head in the direction, Bradshaw looked through the trees, and he saw flashlights in the distance. Something moved through the vegetation directly behind him. Bradshaw spun around to face its source. At first he was hopeful. Was it loose? Hello? He said loudly. Hank? No reply. He shone his flashlight in that direction, but he saw nothing. No movement, no lose. The sound was coming from beyond the reach of Bradshaw's flashlight. Then the smell struck him. A horrid odour like rotten eggs. A bead of sweat trickled down Bradshaw's forehead, and he tightened his grip on the object in his hand. God, he thought to himself, get a grip. There were probably hundreds of rational explanations for that smell. It wasn't like he could think of any, but there must have been. Taking a deep breath, Bradshaw walked towards the source of the smell. It was awful, and now he could discern the undertone of it. What the fuck? As the sulfur smell faded, the rotting smell seemed to grow stronger as a low drone filled the air. He covered his face with his sleeve and shone his flashlight on the ground. The scene before him closely resembled a kill site. Scraps of tattered fabric were strewn across like confetti. The buzz of flies drowned out every single sound. Bradshaw's eyes landed on the mass sprawled in the middle. Christ alive. His mind went blank for a second, feeling bile rise in his throat, and after forcing it back down, he fumbled for his radio. Dispatch, this is MB-32B. I have a 10-100. I repeat, I have a 10-100. The exact location is unclear, though surrounded by oak trees. Bradshaw's radio crackled. Copy that, MB-32B, came the voice of the dispatcher. As it faded into silence yet again, leaving only the buzzing of flies, Bradshaw felt sick. God, he regretted being here, but he didn't have time to calm down. A sound came from behind him. Whirling around, he reached for the holster on his waist and pulled out the pistol. Another noise punctuated the monotone droning. Footfalls, right behind him. He didn't have enough time to fire. The trees around Luz grew sparser as he trudged further from the woodland's dark depths. The air seemed to grow heavy, and it was almost unnervingly silent. A few times Luz thought he'd heard something moving through the vegetation nearby. Hell, he probably had. But then, everything sounded louder in the woods. Worse still, it had started to rain, and now he was utterly drenched. But despite the downpour, that sulfur stench had returned in force, and it was as if Luz had headed straight towards its point of origin. It hadn't been there when Bradshaw passed through earlier that night. He was sure of it. His thoughts were interrupted by a hideous scream, followed by two loud gunshots. Instinctively, Luz whipped out his handgun and spun around in the direction of its source, his heart pounding hard in his chest. The scream was unmistakably human. 
Bradshaw? He half yelled. He was met with silence. The screaming stopped abruptly. Reholstering his pistol, Luz raised his flashlight in that direction. Nothing. He staggered in the direction of the scream. Something must have happened. Had Bradshaw fallen? Luz pushed through the dense underbrush, his footsteps muffled by the leaf litter. Cursing his lack of functioning radio, he pressed forward. A faint rustling sound reached his ears, and he knew that it couldn't have been Bradshaw. It was too close. He directed his flashlight in the direction of the noise. A flash of movement. So quick that for a moment he questioned whether he had seen it. Was that an animal? A person? Who's there? He barked, with renewed, if deceptive, bravado. There was no answer. Don't try anything stupid, I'm armed! Again, no answer. The stench of rotten eggs reached his nostrils again. It was almost unbearable now, as if some hellish smoke was billowing into his lungs. Luz coughed hard and staggered back. From just beyond the reach of his light, he could faintly discern a noise. It was the sound of loud inhalations and exhalations. Luz pulled out his sidearm and aimed it shakily into the inky blackness. Unsteadily, he stepped closer, staring into the void. He was dimly aware that the void was staring back. Come on, you little shit, he mouthed. Come out here where I can see you. But he heard nothing, saw no more. The smell faded away. It was gone. Luz lowered his gun and squinted into the night. From his left came a noise. He held his breath and listened. It was breathing. Bradshaw's breathing. Stuffing the gun back in its holster, Luz staggered in the direction of the noise. Bradshaw! He yelled again. This time there was a response. A weak scoff. Bad time. Luz quickened his pace, his heart pounding in his chest. With each step, the ground beneath his feet grew increasingly uneven, making his progress even more difficult. He stumbled over the protruding roots and fallen branches, his injured calf searing with pain. His flashlight finally landed on Jay Bradshaw's form on the ground. The first thing Luz saw was blood. God, there was so much blood. Bradshaw managed to apply a tourniquet to his leg. Jesus, Luz muttered. Stay still, Jay. What happened here? Bradshaw shook his head. Your guess is as good as mine. He seemed lucid, which was a good sign. One moment everything was fine, and then... I don't even know. Was it a bear? A scoff. Bradshaw gestured to Luz's left. Would a bear do that? Luz turned around. There was the body of a woman, slumped against the base of a tree, her glazed hazel eyes staring vacantly into the sky, skin torn, showing early signs of decay. The abdominal cavity was torn wide open, almost hollowed out. Tattered pieces of clothing seemed oddly jagged, like they'd been bitten into. Nearby, a Winchester rifle lay, snapped clean in two, her throat had been crushed. Oh shit, that's Montgomery. Jesus, Lewis breathed. I had a good look at it, Bradshaw said. Saw it feeding. And let me tell you, that thing wasn't like any bear I've ever seen. You still have your radio? Bradshaw gestured to his right. Lewis snatched up the radio and flicked on the receiver. Dispatch, this is MB-32A, Lewis said. We have a 10999 and a 1054. I repeat, we have a 10999 and a 1054. Requesting immediate backup. Over. A blast of static came from the speakers. Copy that, MB32A, said the dispatching officer. Establishing connection with the radio as we speak. How are you holding up? Pretty banged up. MB32B is priority for the moment. Over. Copy that, can he walk? Not sure yet. If you can, try and get back to the squad car and wait. If you can't, try and stay where you are. We'll pick you up. Bradshaw shrugged. Haven't tried yet. 
I was more focused on keeping that bastard away. Luz assessed Bradshaw's injuries properly. God, it was worse than he thought. There were cuts, deep cuts. Most were on Bradshaw's arms, though some, thankfully least severe of the lot, were on his torso. Through tattered clothing, Luz saw the culprit had managed to slash through a knife-proof vest. Christ. Finally, he stood upright and spoke. I think our best bet would be to get going. If that thing comes back, it will. Lewis nodded. It took some effort to get Bradshaw back to his feet. The leg with the tourniquet was bad, and the matter was complicated by Lewis' wound. But it worked out in the end, and thank fuck for that. With Bradshaw's arm slung around Lewis' shoulder for support, the two of them awkwardly made their way through the dense, dark woods. Each step was a struggle in and of itself. With his flashlight clutched tightly in his free hand, Lou scanned the tree line. He was fairly certain they were heading in the right direction. At least, he hoped they were. The stench had faded away. Now, there were only the smells of the woods and the blood. From the trees behind them, there came a roar. No, roar was the wrong word. A scream. It was one of those sounds, like a mountain lion in heat or a dying rabbit, that sounded almost human. The sound had a nasal quality, like a bull. What the hell was that? Lewis muttered. Bradshaw reached to his sidearm. Hopefully it wasn't what I think it is. As the other officer raised his gun, Lewis kept his sight forward. He didn't want to look back to see the thing that was doubtlessly pursuing them now. A sound came from behind. Footsteps. Loud footsteps, and the smell came back. He stumbled, and his ears rang as Bradshaw fired his first shot. But the sound kept advancing. Lou spun around, aiming at the threat, even though he couldn't see it. Something slammed hard into the two of them. Lou's crashed to the ground. A scream filled his ears. He staggered to his feet and spun around. He was dimly aware of something huge grabbing Jay Bradshaw by the throat and hauling him into the air. And Luz fucking ran. He didn't dare to look back. Didn't dare to slow down. He couldn't even afford to trip, or else that would be it. His mind was a whirl of fear, regret, and confusion. The flashlight beam bobbed erratically in front of him, barely illuminating the trees up ahead. But Lou saw far enough. Up ahead was a partly collapsed tree. It was his best bet. Reaching the fallen tree, Lou squeezed himself into the narrow crevice between the trunk and the jumble of branches. He huddled there, breathless and trembling, praying that it wouldn't find him. It passed by. Minutes ticked by, agonizingly slow, as Lou strained his ears, listening for any sign of the thing. The woods seemed eerily silent, devoid of any sound except for the rustling leaves and his heartbeat. It didn't come back. Taking in a deep breath, Lou slowly emerged from his cover. Hank Lou buried his head in his hands and slumped against the log. Oh God. He'd been stupid. He should have kept shooting. Should have risked it and gone after it when it took Bradshaw. But he didn't. And now that thing had claimed its second victim. Luz knew he might be next. He had to get out. He'd get to his squad car and inform dispatch. Taking in a deep breath, he stood upright and started to walk the way he'd come. After what felt like hours of walking, it occurred to Luz that he was lost, and badly at that. Everything looked the same in that bloody woodland and he was fairly certain that he'd already completely overshot the point he was supposed to turn. But at least the homogeny was starting to fade away. Now Luz could make out gaps in the trees again. Moonlight dimly filtered through the canopy once more. He'd reached a break in the woods. Taking in a deep breath, letting out an unjustified sigh of relief, he pushed on, advancing towards the opening as fast as his aching lungs would allow. He staggered to the edge. Below lay Stag Creek. 
Its waters swollen by the rain, it had become a frenzied torrent. The sight wiped exhaustion from Lou's mind, replacing it with a sinking feeling of despair. There was no way he could cross it on foot, especially in his weakened state. Lou scanned the area, searching for an alternative route. His eyes landed on a fallen pine tree wedged in the side of the embankment. It was the only way he could get across, precarious as it was. If nothing else, he'd been on the different side of the river to that thing. Cautiously, he made his way around to the rocks that fringed the creek and approached the fallen pine tree. It was long and sturdy, with its branches stripped away by time and weather. Liz could see that it leaned slightly towards the other side of the creek, offering a precarious bridge over the raging waters. Taking deep breath, Luz steadied himself and carefully stepped onto the fallen tree. It wobbled under his weight, making his heart race even faster. He knew that any misstep could send him tumbling into the merciless current below. He kept his focus on the opposite bank, his eyes fixed on a solid patch of ground where he aimed to reach. As he inched forward, the tree groaned and shifted. Each step became a test of balance and nerve. Both dissipated as a scream echoed from the trees. Lou slept. No, 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 no! He hit the water hard. His left hand was pinned under his body, and he felt a bone snap as he struck the underlying rock. White-hot pain surged through his shoulder. The moment his head cleared the water, he took in a deep breath, and it took every fiber of his being not to scream. His flashlight drifted away from him. With his good arm, Luz strained and barely grabbed it. It still worked, thank fuck. Awkwardly, he struggled to the surface, hooking his arm around a rock and holding himself in place. From somewhere behind him, there came a loud crash. Gritting his teeth from the pain, he spun around. And there it was, rising from the water. It was tall, far taller than a man. The flashlight illuminated a long face atop a thickly muscled neck. Lou's first thought was that it resembled a cow's head, but it was all wrong. Its mouth stretched too far back. The eyes that stared back at Lou's weren't those of a bull, though they faced forward like those of a man. It was, he realized, like a minotaur. And then, lifting a large hoof foot from the torrent, it started to advance. Lou staggered back, his eyes locked on the creature, watering as that horrid rotten egg stench hit him like a sack of bricks. It was in no rush to attack. It knew he was injured, and it had no reason to charge. Swapping the flashlight for the pistol, Luz raised it and aimed it at the thing. It was the hand he was worst with, but that didn't matter. His finger coiled around the trigger, but the thing kept coming. The moment Hank Luz pulled the trigger, the night briefly turned to day. A bullet struck the Minotaur's thick neck, causing a spray of dark liquid to spurt from the wound. It staggered, clutching the wound with a cleft hand. A low rasp escaped its jaws as it backed off. Luz leveled his pistol at it again and fired. It stumbled back, but then, with a sudden burst of energy, it lunged forward, its heavily muscled body barreling through the water towards him. Oh shit, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit! Lou's heart pounded in his chest as he fired off another round. The Minotaur roared in agony, but its momentum was unstoppable. It was too close, and Lou's was too slow. A three-clawed hand swiped at him, catching him across the chest. He collapsed into the water again, racked by pain. The gun was no longer in his grip. On his feet now, Lou saw the thing surging towards him again, and on instinct, he pulled out his flashlight, shining the beam right into its eyes. It staggered to a halt, its two long jaws parting in a hideous growl of pain. While it was distracted, Luz fumbled around in the creek for his gun. His fingers brushed against the cold metal of his pistol, and with a surge of relief he grasped onto it. Again, he leveled the gun and fired. The Minotaur stopped. Its body shuddered. 
Blood spurted from the middle of its head. Slowly, it pitched forward, crashing into the creek and disappearing beneath the tumultuous surface. Luz watched it for a while, seeing if it would rise, but it never did. Hank Luz lowered his gun, eyes wide, watching it as it sank beneath the surface of the creek. He slumped down on a rock and placed his hand on his chest. It stung, and badly. Luz pulled away his hand and saw blood. Wiping it off with his pant leg, he reached to his belt, pulled out his radio. Oh, thank fuck it still worked. And turned it on, all with his right arm. Dispatch. MB-32A, what the hell happened? Shut up, Luz said, gritting his teeth. And listen... MB-32B is MIA. No, KIA. I've tried every radio channel and heard nothing. I need medical assistance and I need it as soon as possible. Got it? There was a pause from the other end. Copy that. And dispatch? No response. I quit. Those monsters. Those. Things. They hunt in packs. Always watching. Waiting. Luring prey with those orbs on their heads. Like an anglerfish in the sea. Lurking in the darkness for cover. I never thought I'd encounter something like it. I never believed in those tall tales of people encountering monsters, demons, hags, and wraiths. Bigfoot or Nessie are good examples. Ghost encounters, demonic rituals, angels, hell, even skinwalkers gave me nothing but chills. All were just myths to me. Tall tales. Parents trying to scare their kids into obedience or campfire stories to frighten friends and family. Perhaps they're from people who are trying to make sense of the things in the world. Or, so I thought, at least. Now I'm questioning everything. Lies and truths all are blurring together. What is real and what is fake are so hard to tell apart these days. Ever since I met those... things. I carry the burden of trauma and fear. I feel like I'm going insane. Those things I keep mentioning. I just started to refer to them as mimics. You'll see why. Let me tell you a tall tale of my own. Or oh, at least I wish it was a tall tale. I tapped my fingers on the steering wheel to the beat of the song that played from my phone hooked to my car via Bluetooth. It was surprisingly catchy and upbeat for a dark night, alone in the woods. Any sane person would have just slept over at their grandmother's house this late after visiting. But whoever said I made responsible and sane choices? I bobbed my head along to the song and watched as the trees passed by. The silhouettes of evergreens loomed above my little rickety car. It was nothing but an old, well-used cherry-red Chevy Impala. It rattled and complained as I drove down the windy dirt trail that led out of the woods and back to civilization. So far, it was perfect and peaceful. The stars studded the night sky. The moon was shining down on the deep green and quiet forest. My car was barely holding together. I had good music on and I was trying my hardest not to fall asleep at the wheel. Overall, it was rather good. I bit my lip every now and then, just to keep me awake. I worked at a nine-to-five job as a receptionist at a five-star hotel. Staying up late was nothing new to me. Biting my lips or fingers was typically how I kept myself awake. But sometimes I bit myself so hard that I bled. This was one of those times. I kept chewing and chewing on my lip until the warm, metallic liquid of blood flowed into my mouth. 
The pain was dull and didn't really work on keeping me awake anymore. I lifted my right hand quickly and bit my wrist, leaving teeth marks behind as my eyes opened a little more. The pain woke me up. As I was driving, I felt a strange tingling sensation in my head, like someone was tickling my brain. It made me anxious. Maybe it's just my exhausted state taking its toll. I blinked and sighed whilst driving through the woods. Glancing at my phone, I checked the battery. 36%, I mumbled to myself. I stopped the music and shut off my phone, plugging it in so it could charge. If anything went wrong, I wanted a way to contact someone. And then I checked my phone once more. Letting out a shaky sigh, I tapped my steering wheel. No signal. Still alone with my thoughts and now without music, my mind raced with anxious scenarios. One of them came true. A deer darted out in front of my rickety impala. Not wanting to hit it, I swerved and slammed on the brakes. The clanking and pinging sounds of rocks and twigs hitting my sweet little impala filled my ears as the tires lost traction and skidded across the pine needles and dirt. I shrieked and held up my arms to protect my face bracing myself as my car flipped and tumbled down a hill. My heart raced and pounded in my throat and head, sending shockwaves of adrenaline through my body. A cold and sharp feeling of fear clawed and ripped at my nerves as the rolling and bouncing car tossed my already exhausted body around. Metal crumpled and creaked whilst glass shattered and attacked my skin and threatened to strike my eyes. My impala slammed into a tree stopping the continuous tumbling and jerking me around like an old, worn-down ragdoll. I took shaky breaths. I was full of adrenaline and very much awake. I collected my phone and an eight-inch switchblade before I began to work my way out of the destroyed vehicle and into the cool night air. Mustering all the strength I had left in my battered and bleeding body, I kicked the door open and hauled myself through the dirt and pine needles. My little impala was lying flat on its roof and smoking from the front. It was dented, broken, and no longer barely holding it together. I heaved shallow and unsteady breaths as I sat on the forest floor, staring at my totaled car. Eventually, the natural painkiller that was adrenaline subsided, and the pain kicked in snapping me out of my state of day's shock. My legs felt numb and stiff. I didn't want to stand up. I wanted to sit there and wait out the night till help arrived, but help would never come unless I sought it out. Alone in the woods at night was a dangerous situation in itself, but injured and alone in the woods at night was completely different levels of danger. The smell of my blood could potentially attract unwanted things to me. Sitting there was just asking for something bad to happen, and that made my anxiety spike, as if it wasn't high enough already. First things first was to find a hot spot, where I could call for a rescue and wait until it arrived. I slowly shifted to crawl on my hands and knees and dug around in my car. I pulled out my messenger bag and opened up the glove box finally taking note of the cuts on my arms and hands, along with the blood that trickled down and smudged everything I touched. I shoved a handful of about five glow sticks into my bag and grabbed a flashlight. I flicked it on and off. Nothing. The battery was dead. I grunted in frustration and tossed the useless flashlight into the back seat, to the annoyance of my arm. I backed up out of the car slowly, being careful of the glass shards scattered about. My hands were already bleeding and in pain. I didn't need any more cuts and bruises. I slowly stood up, stumbling to my feet and using the wrecked car as support whilst I caught my bearings. My legs felt stiff and shaky. Unsteady, if you will. Not much pain down there. I took a deep breath and straightened up slowly as I pulled out a glow stick and snapped it. 
shaking it up until all the chemicals inside were mixed together. I began my trek to the bridge that led to the paved road down the mountain. That's where the nearest hotspot was, at least. The silver moon was mostly covered by the wisps of clouds. It made me uneasy because now it was darker. A light breeze caressed the evergreens and my battered body. It made my injuries more pronounced. I had no first aid kit, so all I had to do was just hope the smell of my blood didn't attract anything unwanted, whether that be wolves, bears, or even mosquitoes. I felt like I was being watched. Every one of my steps were being judged. I felt helpless. I was alone, cold, helpless, injured, and lost. The perfect prey for any predator who caught a whiff of my scent and decided that they needed a midnight snack. The breeze gently pushed me along as I stumbled around in the dark, following the dirt trail to safety. My uneven steps quickened as I felt the need to get out of there. I felt followed. I felt hunted. I felt like danger lurked around every corner and hid in every shadow. My breath kept snagging in my throat for a few seconds before I realized it, and held it again while stumbling through the dark with my only light source, a measly green glow stick. The moon was unreliable thanks to the wind pushing the clouds in front of it, but at least I had something to see in the dark with. I refused to pull out my phone. I needed to save the battery on it. It was my ticket out, and I had to make sure not to lose it. Rustling sounds in the bushes caught my attention. I stopped walking and raised my glow stick higher to see my surroundings more clearly. My eyes scanned the area repeatedly for danger as my heart thumped in my chest. I looked over it thoroughly. But I didn't see anything in the dark besides shrubs, ferns, trees, and grass. I shook my head and ruled it out as my heightened nerves or some passing by critter. So I kept moving. I needed to keep moving. I doubted I would get attacked. But that didn't mean I couldn't. It felt as though the atmosphere just kept getting darker and colder. Those uneasy feelings seemed to only grow worse. My nerves tingled and spiraled beyond my control. They made me feel queasy. Low, chittering growls came from the trees. The bushes and branches rustled. Yet, nothing could be seen. My blood froze as I realized my gut feeling was right. I was being hunted. My instincts told me to run, but my brain told me otherwise. I couldn't stop it if I did that. I'd be a sitting duck. But running would make them chase me. So despite how everything in my body battled over what I should do, I kept walking. The growling and chittering and hissing kept following me as I traversed the dirt path. And then, a glowing orb flickered to life in the darkness. It floated a few feet above the ground and swayed slightly. A bright yellow light and then another, and another, until there were four glowing orbs surrounding me. Three were blue. The first orb was yellow. Uh, uh, iris came a whisper from one of the orbs. It sounded like... Mom? Iris, follow us, came another voice. It sounded like... My best friend, Vivian. The orbs floated around me as they whispered my name and beckoned me. Iris, it's okay. Just follow us, came another voice. My dad's voice. I was intrigued, suspicious, and frightened. All of these voices were of people close to me. Mom, Dad, my twin brother, Keegan and Viv. 
The orbs moved closer as I stood there, watching with a flurry of emotions swirling around inside me, like a tornado that didn't know which direction to go. But I was curious about what they were intending to do, and why they wanted me to follow them. I reached out to touch the yellow one, curious about it. The yellow orb that sounded like my mum lowered so I could touch it. But the orb lowered and revealed it. In the light was the face of some sort of monster. It looked like an oversized bird with a large, pale yellow beak filled with rows of sharp, jagged yellow teeth. Its eyes were the blackest of blacks, and in the shape of a stretched-out rhombus. Large, bat-like ears that were easily bigger than my hand flattened as it growled. The orb was attached to what looked like a thick black string, much like that of an anglerfish. Hello, Iris, it spoke in the distorted, raspy and deep voice of my mother. My blood flowed like rivers of ice as I stared in complete horror. The clouds moved past the moon and let it shine down on the creature. It was hunched down and had long, slender arms with four fingers and long, scaled legs of a bird. The arms resembled that of a dinosaur, but longer. The underarms were decorated with long feathers. I screamed and backed away quickly, only to get nudged by another one of those creatures. Clipping their beaks and teeth together, they kept nudging me back into the circle. I tripped over a rock and fell into the dirt and pine needles that dressed the grass, dropping my glow stick as I stared at them with what I can only describe as pure terror. Then the yellow-orbed one pounced, grabbing my left arm and yanking me upwards. The pain shot through me like electricity as I let out a blood-curdling scream. I felt my arm pop out of its socket as the bone-crunching strength of another mimic crashed down on my forearm, snapping it like a toothpick and causing me to flail and scream even more. Another one latched onto my right leg and just went crazy, biting it and tearing at my flesh. This was a sign. The sign that the hunger-driven frenzy was beginning. In desperate attempt to get away, I yanked out my switchblade and slashed at the yellow-orbed mimic right in the eye. That mimic I thought was the Alpha. It screeched and let go of me. It dropped me roughly on the ground as it backed away and rubbed its face. My eyes narrowed and I slashed at the one leached off my right leg. It did the same thing, screeching and letting go of me as it rubbed its face and stamped its feet. The adrenaline pumped through my body again and numbed my pain, while the shock also kicked in. On whatever was left of my right leg, I scrambled to my feet and ran. I heard a horrific screech and thunderous, yet fast footsteps that soon followed after the battle cry. Iris! Welcome back! You don't want to help you! Iris! The leader shrieked in that distorted voice of my mother, but I ran, not looking back at the things following me. I didn't notice how much blood I was losing or how severe my injuries were. I just needed to run. To get away alive. I panted and stumbled my way through the threatening dark of the night, following the dirt path to salvation. I cried and screamed for help, even though nobody would hear me. I heard chittering and footsteps next to me. Besides me was one of the mimics. It hissed and slammed into me, sending my poor body flying, crashing and skidding into the dirt. My brain felt like it had just been made into a smoothie, as did my sights. I was dizzy, nauseous and still high as hell on adrenaline. Panting and slowly standing up, the group circled me again. Another one flicked its tail at me. Strong, long and muscular. Easily sixteen-ish pounds of pure muscle came crashing into my side and sent me flying into a tree. I grunted as I hit the tree and the ground soon afterwards. I felt my hands shaking as I attempted to stand. My balance was unsteady and my limbs were even shakier. I heaved heavy breaths, 
through my chest as I stared at what I thought was my demise. The mimics growled and clipped their beaks together as they stared at me, seemingly waiting for the Alpha's orders. With a hiss from the Alpha, one of the subordinates lunged at me, swiping down on my body. Its claws snagged the flesh of my torso and essentially cut me open. I screamed and curled up from the sharp pain that came afterwards. It went in for another attack, but I used my switchblade to defend myself by slamming the blade into the roof of its mouth. It screeched and writhed as I held my hand there. A warm, dark liquid oozed onto my arm and hand, coating it with the stench of that familiar metallic smell of blood. The rest was a blur. I remember snippets of running through the woods on the moonlit night. A trip home gone wrong. My memory comes back to the bridge. An old wooden bridge suspended above a small creek. Rickety and worn down from many years of being trodden and driven on. Around me were a few cop cars and an ambulance. The lights flashing blue and red over and over in my vision. I looked down to see myself covered in blood. My jacket and jeans were coated in large, dark, warm patches of what I assumed was my blood. The adrenaline worn off. I collapsed in pain. It suddenly dawned on me that my left arm was completely useless. It was mangled beyond recognition. And I felt dizzy. Definitely from the blood loss. The medic scooped me into a stretcher and whisked me away to hospital. My right arm clutched the switchblade. With the lights, I was able to see myself clearly, despite phasing in and out of consciousness. Blue. The blood was blue. It was the blue of those things. The mimics. I don't remember much of the ride in the ambulance, besides weakly answering questions and having unfamiliar faces hover over me, talking to each other in medical terms I didn't and still don't understand as I watched them in vision that refused to focus on anything. My family visited me and the doctor said my motor functions won't be the same, neither will my looks. Turns out my right leg was mangled, but salvageable. My left arm was broken and dislocated. I now have a scar running from under my left breast to my hip. It's light pink and jagged, like someone stretched out a long earthworm and laid it on my body. My skin was covered in the battle scars from my struggle with the pack or flock or pod or whatever you call those monsters, the mimics. Neurological damage was sustained to my arm and leg, so I have a limp and damaged motor functions on top of everything else. Plus, medical bills, rent, no car and everything else that comes along with it. Fired from my job due to scaring away customers. There was now a strike happening, and employees were quitting in the masses. What a bittersweet, petty revenge. That encounter with the group of mimics damaged more than just my physical state. My mental state has rapidly rotted away, leaving me to decay and morph into the pathetically hollow shell of a woman I once was. What was most scary about the situation was not the fact I was face to face with certain death. It was how they tracked and killed their prey. They knew your moves before you could make them. They read your mind and collected your memories. They manipulated their prey into following the lights on their heads. And then, they ate them, tearing flesh and breaking bones. I always worried that they would find me again and finish what they started. But they couldn't possibly follow me into the city, right? All the smells, all the sounds are different from their woodland home. All the loud noises and new smells would overwhelm them and disorient them. If they enter the city, they're either incredibly stupid or incredibly smart. 
but I was wrong. Mauled bodies started popping up around the city. These corpses were so destroyed and messed up, it was hard to believe that those victims once looked like who they had once were. People who were once alive, breathing, moving and speaking humans, were now getting reduced to nothing but a pile of destroyed organs, torn skin, splotched of blood and shattered bone. Very much dead, and not breathing, nor moving. They were coming hunting for me. They had a taste of my flesh, my warm, soft meat, and they wanted more. They wouldn't stop until they consumed every last morsel. I'm not safe here, nor is everybody else that lives in this city. It won't be long before they found me. I endangered everyone here, until I'm dead, they won't leave this city. I'm going insane, and I know it. I can't sleep at night without having night terrors, without picturing their faces in my mind. Without being drawn back into the night, I almost died. I hate being alone. Because being alone would mean they would get me. It would mean I'm defenseless, and would make for easy pickings. I'm moving to Los Angeles soon. My family members are pitching in to pay rent. Keegan and his wife will be joining me. To keep an eye on me and cut expenses. Away from the forests and away from those fiends. Those heathens. I can't help but blame myself these days. After all, it was my choice. All of this happened because I didn't want to sleep at my grandma's house for one night.